<clears throat> good morning. Good morning. Good morning, man. Isn't it interesting? I wonder. I don't know. I mean, has there ever been a time when you didn't, like, in a public forum, self-edit? I mean, I don't. It's. I guess we call it humility or I modesty would say or something. This. If I weren't a pastor, no. Right, but then you'd be like the jujitsu guy you just said. Right. No, hundred percent. The only reason I self-edit on social media, and I'm, that's stretching it if you've seen my personal IG account, but um, like with my Warrior Priest gym account, that's the gym, so that's a different forum. It, on my Reverend account, that's pastoral stuff, that's 1517, <laughs> you know. know. It's not like <clears throat> as if there's three person, you're like the three-faced uh, giant or something. Pretty but. much, but it's like, yeah, but um, the Grand Tribunal from Marvel Comics, uh -huh. there's always one fly, so... Well, there's now the there's four no face thing in the and this uh, Transformers the movie. That's I forget what right. That's called. Um, they're the judges. I forget what they're called. Oh, right, right, right. But anyways, the point is, no, I only self edit, and I don't really self edit that terribly much on my personal account because it's my personal account. So, and well, it's also private. Point? Though. Oh, the quintessence. Quintessence. They have five okay. faces. <clears throat> I think if your account's private, then you're free to do what you want to do. So long as you're willing to accept the consequences. Uh, yeah. I mean, this the problem is, is that there's been many exposés showing that Mark any Chad. any meta mm -hmm. property uh, private doesn't make any difference. They still no. share. They still share it with law enforcement. <laughs> no, I don't mean that point. I just mean in the sense of, as a pastor, I'm not going to put stuff on my on my Reverend Riley um, page. <clears throat> because I'm not going to be talking about like health and well-being and gardening and medicine and I don't stuff. No, like I that. talked about this this morning a little bit with the congregation, though. Mm -hmm. Because morning fresh, um, yeah, D fresh was there actually. The uh, you know there there is a lot of wisdom literature in the scriptures, yeah, which include right. health and well-being. We were looking at the because it's Mary Magdalene today, so it's yeah. Proverbs 31. You know, which mm -hmm. I don't yeah. really apply to her, but it doesn't matter. Right. And some of the things it talks about, um, the commentary I looked at is really good on this because it's like she's faithful. Mm -hmm. Right, she's industrious. She works, mm -hmm. and she's also wise. Mm -hmm. She wise. Oh no, no, no! Not wise. The wisdom. No, no. Wisdom is part of faithfulness. Um, she's a but warrior. Told, well, she's yes. got. But the tra they translate it all out in ESV right. and and New King James. The yeah. warrior tropes are missing. Right. They're, they 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 soften it. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know she she strengthens her arms like for battle, and it's like oh, so yeah. I mean this is. Uh, well, that's the problem, though, is that in the present tense, we haven't really defined what wisdom is anymore. And also, mm -hmm. if you notice, yeah, I mean, that you don't to actually hear too. anyone described as being wise. Very few people are, are actually, like, that's applied to them. Like, this is a very wise woman or man. It's, you don't even use it anymore. It's like honorable or maybe, integrity. Maybe, I mean, maybe we saw a little bit of that with the, with the um, intellectual dark web folks. You know, not all of them, some of them. I mean, Peter mm -hmm. Singh probably still holds up as well. I mean, he is wise, actually, I would say. He's not well, always get, smart, but so, I mean, he's smart. Right. The modern definition of wisdom is experience divorced from emotion. So meaning okay. like you have to go through something, live past it long enough so that there's no longer an emotional attachment to that. So event. it's lived experience applied to the then present. Then you can actually look at it objectively okay. and learn from it. Sure. And wisdom in the past, though, it's like when you read the Hagakure, the Japanese book of Bushido, wisdom is... It's a, it's connected to intelligence, but intelligence and wisdom are connected to relationships. Mm -hmm, right. Tell me who you talked to today, and I will tell you whether you're wise or not. So right, it's that's all what extroverted. I, it's all. That's why I pointed out with uh, Paul says in both. I think both Titus and Timothy he tells both of them is like you know encourage the the older men. Yeah. You know to be with the younger men. Right. And the older women with the younger women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like how else are? You, and it's not just traditionalism, right? Mm -hmm. In the, we in the worst sense. We should record because this is actually juicy stuff. But. Okay, I can Plus, hit the into young Goodman Brown. So, um, no, I mean the idea that that wisdom, I mean it is it has to be carried forward. It doesn't right. It doesn't well, just. That's a great point you raised because I I was ruminating on this on Wednesday on my podcast talking about getting old, and living smarter, not harder, training smarter, not harder. But mm -hmm, within mm -hmm. that context, I brought that up of. We criticize the boomers for everything that's wrong in the church and society, and rightfully so to a large extent, because they were the generation that changed society from what it was, this kind of immigrant population that was still not yet the America that you and I know today. And when all those people came back from the war and they had grown up in the Depression and all that they had lived through and then come back and right. everything that comes out of the 50s and even into the 60s and 70s, we blame them for everything wrong in the church and society, and rightfully so. It wasn't a critical revision. It was a but wholesale rejection. But then we grew up 
we were the latchkey generation. We were the generation they invented microwaves for because we weren't allowed to use the stove when we came home from school because our parents weren't home. We had to use the microwave. But we were also taught a certain ethic, at least I was, and I think you were too, which is one, I'm special. Two, I'm gifted. Three, I'm a snowflake. Four, do whatever makes you happy. You can be anything you want to be because our parents were reacting to their parents. Mm -hmm. So then right. we grew up thinking, well, I can be anything I want to be. So you see in the 90s, especially, especially the early 90s, the massive shift. In the 80s, a majority of bachelor's degrees were business. In the 90s, it literally switched to 60 to 70% liberal arts degrees. So then what Not happened, in the best sense of liberal arts either. <laughs> no, I'm talking like literature degrees, art degrees, you know, pottery, underwater basket weaving, that kind of stuff. So we then, this is the natural outcome of, that, of our generation being raised to be anti-institutional, anti-government, never trust authority, question everything, everything's subjective, there is no objectivity, you can be whatever you want. Well, we then taught, again, if you wanna complain about millennials, it's our generation's fault, not the boomers. But we don't mm -hmm. wanna take the baton up and carry that forward, and we don't wanna admit the reason that this generation lacks wisdom and courage and integrity is because we taught them that. We mm -hmm. taught them, hey, my mom and dad said I could be anything I wanted to be, so I decided to get a degree in art rather than a degree in business. Whereas we're saying to you, you can even be whatever gender you want to be. Right. You don't even have to be human if you don't want to. You can choose to be a cat or a foxkin. You can That's do anything funny. you want to do. I and actually saw I saw a grade school teacher. Libs of TikTok is one mm -hmm. of the, the best feeds. <laughs> right. Because uh, I don't want to go on TikTok at all. I don't want to have an account. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they, you know, they call some of the worst example. I don't know what it is with, with elementary, middle school teachers mm -hmm. posting all their completely idiotic stuff on TikTok, but they do. Right. It's like, it's perfect platform for them, I suppose. But um, she was talking about how she and her partner, uh, presumably some kind of queer or something or other, um, you know, how they've learned to communicate with meowing. And she was mm -hmm. explaining all the different meows that they use and, you know, and how, how hard this one was to learn. Like, because sometimes words, words just don't work, she said. <laughs> to do the meows. My four-year-old thinks that way too. Right. And so then <laughs> the point was, is that, you know, the because the, the same ethos, these same, a lot of the same people will then argue that, um, you know, they're, they're the ones who understand these children better than their parents do. Right. Mm -hmm. So they so then rather than have the, the kids have carry for this wisdom that, yes, yeah. there's always been um, uh, people who are, you know, gender wise, you know, if you mm -hmm. want to use the categories of gender and sex, I don't know. Gender is language for me. But regardless, John money. <laughs> anyway that you know there's been people it. who are like more effeminate but they're masculine but they're male but they're more mm -hmm. effeminate right and mm -hmm. this kind of things i also remembered this it's like these people were always always in literature and, mm -hmm. and, and then later in film and media they're always the ones that you're suspicious of the ones who mm -hmm. you know are kind of ambiguous right mm -hmm. as far as they're um they're not strongly masculine or feminine there's something you mean like oscar wilde walt whitman <laughs> Yes, yeah, suspicious characters. Thank you. Right. <laughs> and, Emerson. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm talking about the actual characters in the in the in the works. Oh, okay. Right. And you think, oh, what was the most recent example that came to mind? Oh, it's to it's totally creepy. Um, the main villain in Mr. Robot. I don't know if you watch Mr. Robot. Yeah, I watched the yeah. first two seasons. Yeah. Right. I think I think you meet the person by then. It's it's a he she kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Asian. Yeah. Just kind of running the whatever the secret cabal is. It's been a couple yeah, yeah. years since I watched it all now. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those one of those weird shows that seems to reveal a lot of what's real, yeah. But does it in fiction and like, well, why are right. you telling us? I'm not mm -hmm. really sure. Wouldn't it be better just to not tell us and let us just remain in no, ignorance? No, because if you if you put it in in that 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 media, you it accept immediately, it when you see it. Uh, it immediately uh, categorizes it as entertainment. So then, if you and I then go out and spout it. You're like, oh, I got you. you. It's like we're disqualified. Guys, yeah, it's like guys who post memes like sheepdog, like self defense, like you know, mm -hmm. gun country memes, but they use the picture in the backgrounds from a movie, and they have some you know very extremely masculine, like <laughs> proverb or something you know like right. the wolf come blah 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 you know that kind of thing, and you're like your picture that you're using for your meme is a fictional person. He's an actor. And he's not that character in real life. Like he's the opposite of the character he plays in real life. He's extremely soft and feminized and right. Yeah. And you're like, you're defeating the purpose of the meme by using fictional characters played by actors. Yeah. When you're talking about being authentic and real, right? 
So if we blame millennials, it's because we did it. Like we were the ones that raised them to be the way they are. It's like George Carlin says about politicians, if this is the best we can do, it's because that's who we are. We, we vote into office. And of course, he doesn't believe that either because he talks about the same little screed. But he's like, you voted for these people. This is the best that we can do, which means it's not the politicians that suck. It's you. <laughs> and so if there's no wisdom, guess what? Somebody raised those kids without wisdom. Someone didn't, like you said, and bring, bring it back. The women in church are not bestowing and imbuing the younger women with wisdom and neither are the older men i see no. it all the time they're not right and but some of that's just disrespect because we look at mm -hmm. the older men and we're like well how come they aren't stepping up you know right what happened there i mean what did mm -hmm. they not receive from the generation before right i think that idea of like it's, it's really been an attack on gen it's a generational kind of warfare of course you're, always. You're, yeah oh yeah you're trying to divorce um the children from the parents and the parents mm -hmm. from the grandparents and it's not, and like I said, I'm cautious about this because I don't want it to just be like, well, traditionalism, right? It's like, well, we just carry things forward because, because. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we, we, we always do it critically. We're looking and saying, well, you know, from their perspective, this seemed right. They had a lot of the right idea, but, you know, it was a little off kilter, mm -hmm. so, right? So we're going to, we're going to twist it a little bit for our context. I mean, we might mm -hmm. still be wrong too, but from our perspective, you know, this is where a little bit weird and it gets, has to get adjusted. Right. You know, um, but... <laughs> Or, or maybe this is something they did. I, I think about this like hymnody in the church, right? Sure. They sang this hymn. It's just not, it's really not appropriate in, you know, yeah. anymore. It wasn't necessarily wrong or it wasn't, mm -hmm. it just wasn't that great. Right. It doesn't really need to, we Very don't need to keep of it. time. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to keep it because it, oh yeah, because it's, it's, it doesn't have that timeless character. It just seems kind of, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a great piece of art. It ends up right. just being like felt banners as you like well, to call them. You, yeah. Well, and the thing is now since the, 50s in particular, we have the privilege and the leisure to not worry about things like wisdom until we're in our 40s and 50s. Whereas previous mm. generations had no choice because their experience was growing up during the Depression, growing up on the prairie, growing up in a situation where every day they had to find food. Well, and maybe there was a filtering effect too, because the, yeah. you know, as far as the amount of things that they could consume or be, have mm -hmm. access to was limited. Right. It, it yeah. it's kind of a self, there was a like almost a self auditing that happens. It's like right. you know what you're gonna have a Bible, mm -hmm. and you're maybe you you might have I don't know some classic liter piece of literature mm -hmm. Shakespeare or something, right? Um, that's not that's really it. literature; it's poem. But that's it, right? Yeah. But like, if you have if you have even just a Psalter. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be a lot right. farther along. This is what we this you know you recommended uh, in the last show, Book of Eli, and I finally mm -hmm. watched it last night. And I mean that's the premise of the show, right. of the movie. It's yeah. like uh, that if you only had this book, the whole world you would see the whole world differently. You would live a totally different life, right. and and that's why they that's why they that's why they burned them all. Yep. And like actually maybe even fought the war over that, which is right. kind of an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. we don't because that's what the scriptures are. You're talking about 6,000 years of wisdom at least, right? right? Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. yeah. So whew, that's that's kind of an impressive idea. And I was thinking about this, and we can use it to segue into uh, the parable for today, or story if you want to raise it. Is, Speaking of an old story that we're trying to bring It's also to the part of that tradition that when we preach, and we're all guilty of this, because this is the old Adam's turn, we don't preach in such a way that the God of Israel is also alive and kicking today. <laughs> Right. Yeah. We've talked yeah. about this. We kind of Protestantize slash spiritualize God out of creation because or maybe we do the, the man with a thousand faces thing to it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The Joseph yeah. Campbell move, because I think what happened with postmodernity is this. We figured out that we couldn't escape the creation. So instead, what we'll do is we'll just destroy metaphysics. <laughs> Actually, maybe we can escape creation. We're sort of trying to right now. Yeah, but we're turning inward rather than outward. We end up it just was this being constant movement away from distorted, away from, away from. ugly versions of what we were. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, before it was like, well, okay, God's here and we can't escape him. So let's go find a place to hide in the garden. Right. But, which is ironic because he's in the garden and they thought he was outside right. the garden. Well, that's just his garden. Right. <laughs> and so at a certain point, I think we just stopped running. We ran out of jungles to explore and mountains to climb and, you know, glaciers to traverse. And then, and you know, trying to launch into space and all that stuff. And instead, now in searching the ocean, we did all that. We think, of course, we've only explored like 99% uh, yeah, of the ocean. No, right. But we're right. like, eh, good enough. 
Um, so now we've turned inward. We've literally become enthusiasts where with virtual reality and everything, we're just curved, literally curving in ourselves. It's what saying, was it? I, I mentioned it before. It was Harari. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Homo, Homo sapiens was an interesting mm -hmm. book, but uh, he's gone really globalist now. Yeah. And uh, or maybe he always was. But uh, what did he say? Oh, what do we do with the people who aren't very useful? Um, mm -hmm. Well, he doesn't advocate killing them. He says, we'll just give them drugs and video games. Yes. And they'll kill themselves. Right. They just drive them in like completely inward. Um, there was the study. I mean, it's not necessarily uh, confirmed yet, but uh, we've talked about SSRIs a few times. Mm hmm. And it turns out that the chemical imbalance thing was actually, according to this study, uh, completely propaganda. It's not actually true. It's not mm -hmm. serotonin levels that cause Correct. depression. Yeah. And the I drugs don't actually... i psychiatrists at this point who made the same claims. Yeah. The, it's not that. Um, but guess... It doesn't really propose <laughs> what it is. If you want to see how deep the indoctrination goes, post about this on social media. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I've never gotten more pushback on anything I've posted. Oh, yeah. From your SSRI stuff? Well, well so many. That, what is it? Like... like 10 15 percent of u.s u.s citizens yeah i think i think it's, it's, 10, it's 10 or 15 percent yeah so you're saying one in 10 people are yeah you take a drug drugs. that imbalances your brain chemistry so that you need to take the drug and then of course you can't live without the drug because the drug well, is actually that, the thing that's and that was the study you. is that maybe this even this idea of brain chemistry isn't really the mechanism Correct. at all yeah it could be hormones. I mean, well, the I problem is now sense. that we know so much about the gut-brain biome and the relationship mm -hmm. between the gut, the brain, and the intestines, whereas before it was very Cartesian, like your brain's just this thing in your head separate from the rest of you, very platonic, whereas now we're like, no, actually, if the gut's yeah. off, the brain's off. So all right, platonic or even mechanical, right? Yeah, human. Body's a Lock, machine, yeah. and we just you just have Pops, to yeah. oil, oil things the right way. Yeah. You know, like the Tin Man. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other? There was a connection. There. Oh, it doesn't matter. Right. Should we uh, play the opening uh, theme Let's music? Yeah, play the theme music and we'll dive right in. We're already recording, so that's. I was going to say I like that though. We do it before we hit it so that we can clear out everybody, and then just roll right into the episode. I actually listen to a podcast. It's always long form. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes two to three hours, and the things that they actually want to say they don't put into the last thirty minutes. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of preamble, and yeah, it's sure. not always relevant. Yeah. And it's just kind of to just burn out all the chaff of people right. who aren't who are just mm -hmm. trolling to try to find something you know to, to be offended exactly. by. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, and you just put it at the end before, when nobody's right. listening anymore, except for the people who care. Right. Pretty clever. We just put it at the front end. Oh well. Yeah. So. Whatever works. We talk about it works. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 259. And we are, as always, your host, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and willin', maxin' and relaxin'. And I'm Dom Riley. I trained with my coach before coming back to record this, so my brain is activated and my body is beaten down like a twice-risen doe. I went for a hard ride, so same Good. story. Fantastic. Ready to go. So we're feeling it. So today on the show... We're going to return to our Nathaniel Hawthorne for something I've brought up, I think, numerous times, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, I knew John we were Goodman Brown, <laughs> which makes me laugh every time I read it, although I don't think he intended it as a comedy. But as we read it, maybe you will find the dark humor within it. It is a short story, but simultaneously parabolic, as many mm -hmm. of Hawthorne's short stories are. There is a book you can get on Amazon. It's entitled Dr. Heidegger's Experiment and Other Stories. It's a small hardcover book, if you can find it, pocket-sized, and it's Hawthorne's best short stories, arguably. It's a fun little book. It's great to have. It's got good font, good margins. You can carry it around. It's one of those, remember when people used to buy books because they had a certain feel to them? You liked the paper, uh, you liked the font. The remember print. when? Uh, I kind of still do. So. Yeah, I do too. That's why it's on my desk. But Well, yeah. and now and now having watched, uh, as you said before, he... Um, went officially started mm -hmm. having watched book of eli i'm like yeah this is why i have a reference library yes <laughs> it's like well you will own nothing and be happy applies to entertainment nowadays pretty much to everybody in the united states yeah yeah so music media but also um literature yeah. the whole deal it's right. like any any kind of like cultural transmission <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, has to be cut off so that the culture right. can be re rejiggered rewritten it's, it's interesting to me on that point how many people will say to me, well, you don't really believe the internet will ever be taken away from us. And I said, that's not the point. The point it, is, if it goes down, I don't have access to my stuff. 
Whereas right. if I'm on a blackout, it's January and it rains and the power line goes out, I've got books, I've got my video games on disc, I've got CDs and records. Plus it's you just, spent, you know, decades putting it up, up yeah, here. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we like we were talking about backstage. It's a term I learned last night listening to a podcast. Backstage, nice. meaning like before it. we backstage. record. Yeah. <clears throat> if you don't have that, you don't have wisdom. Because all that stuff is just people passing on to you their experience in written form, for example, or in, in right. audio, audio form. And to have that then committed to memory, people don't appreciate that. I know, at least I come, probably you and I come from the last generation who emphasized memorization. Mm. When it came, not just to learning, like for, you know, getting ready for a test, which I don't actually agree right. with that method, but no, rather when you read something, when you listen to something, you, you like 1984, you and I would get a record or a cassette. That's what you got for three or four or five months. So you I would listen, go to the library. And, yes, I would too. Exactly. Yeah. And but you could only check out. out two or, well, I did CDs. <laughs> I'm a little yeah. younger. Two, three, I think, or maybe it was three. Yeah, there was a three, limit. Three CDs at a time, yeah. something like that. And then when the and, CD and it wasn't a great along, collection, oh. which is how I ended up actually listening to music I wouldn't have so, otherwise. Interesting like side story. <laughs> Here, we'll, we'll clean everybody out with this one. So interesting anecdote. Okay. So when I started seminary in 98, that's right when a lot of the tobacco settlements were, you know, finally mm. being finalized. So okay. in Minnesota, all that tobacco money was given to the libraries by the state and to museums. Because there was really? like some stipulation that had to be used for like the public good or something. So all of a sudden in 98, 99, 2000, all of the libraries around us, all of a sudden they had all these DVDs and all these CDs and all this, these new books, right? So you would go and because Annie and I had separate accounts, she would check out her limit, which is like, you know, 20 books, CDs, DVDs all together. And mm -hmm. I would check out 20, take them home, rip all of them and then go back. So I, I'd say like 500 CDs in my CD collection are just from the Como Library. Thank you, Como Library. It's because, yeah, you just take really them hard to separate the two now. Yeah, just rip them. So that was the great thing about that gen that era was oh, now we have the we can rip CDs and DVDs instead of having to commit them to memory or spend the entire night downloading dot LimeWire MP3s. Yeah, you're such a heathen. I know, right? Hmm. But before that, you would literally sit on the living room floor or on your bed or wherever, and you would just read the lyrics out of the mm -hmm. the jewel case, pull them out, open it up, right, trifold, and then listen to the You would listen to that CD every day because that's all you had. You had a certain right. number of CDs. Well, and when or, they were 15 bucks or 12 bucks a pop. Yes, when they first came out, you're like, oh, I can't afford a $15 CD. That's in, that's ridiculous. Because imagine what that was like. I mean, what five? would that be today? That'd be like 45? Yeah. Inflation? Yeah. Shush. Yeah. Can you imagine? So, yeah, I mean, it's I guess just people weird. spend 40, 40 bucks on an LP, though. Yeah. Brand new. Well, yeah. yeah. But you, it's just the point of you, you had to sit with it because you didn't have any other choice. If you found somebody who had like 40 records or 40 cassettes, you, you were amazed. It was like, oh, yeah. You have, a, you have a milk crate full of records? That's amazing. <laughs> He's like, well, how many do you have? Well, I have six. They sit on my shelf with my comic books. That's all I have. Yeah, because we were poor too, so it wasn't like I could just buy something right. and come no, to the store. We here. went once a month to the store. So I wonder about this, though. Um, you know, as far as like great stories, mm -hmm. it does seem to me that that you know every maybe not broad culture, but but smaller you know cultures, microculture, whatever you want to call it, small communities, they're going to have their collection of like their stories and right. their songs. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. um, and that's how they and that's how they carry this. You know. What, yeah. what we were calling wisdom, but just mm -hmm. even knowledge too mm -hmm. is carried forward that way, mm -hmm. right? And then, so before we, well, backstage, as you said, um, I think what happened with the generational schisms that were brought into bear yeah. like between X and, and boomers and, you know, our parents mm -hmm. and whatnot, is that, you know, uh, when I was in Michigan, we had the, they called it the brain drain. You know, the kids moved out of the state. Mm -hmm. And so you couldn't even like persist in the same industry yeah. Those industries died because the kids left and they did, right. or they were encouraged to go to college to gain some stupid degree that didn't have anything to do with anything. Like what's happening today in certain states. It's worse today, I think, yeah. um, than, you know, when we went through school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the debt load is the same, but the, but the, even the applicability, the applicability is even yeah. worse, you know, gender studies or something. Um, is that you just fracture communities, you fracture mm -hmm. 
and you fracture civilization ultimately right because because you you can't build upon anything because that right there's there's no no one's well now the trend here in the farm community is that you know you do have people going into trades much mm-hmm. more than even five, when i started four years ago yeah it's like no i'm an apprentice as a plumber or as a yep. you know um uh, i have one that's apprenticing as a precision driller you know like nice. cnc and that kind of stuff yeah. I'm like, let's, well i think they grow we up need seeing that. the crushing debt that their, their parents are under from just a four-year degree let alone a master's or a phd or even just dissatisfaction with life i mean well that's why i teach my kids i'm like i appreciate as i get older i appreciate my education i do because mm-hmm. i had that opportunity and other people yeah. were baking breaking their backs working in sod farms and working in barns milking and stuff like that right but if i had to do it over i wouldn't do it over People are always like, if I had to do it over again, I'd do the same thing. I'm like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have gone to college. I would have gone to trade school. Because as far as the debt, the crushing debt limit and the applicability of my degrees and just the overall disdain, because in the 90s, it was already starting to be a conversation of the anti-intellectualism of our culture. Whereas today, people are just so collectively dumb that they're not even capable of thinking about what the words are that are coming out of their mouths and how they constantly contradict themselves. And yeah. a large part of that is, yeah, the way they're raised, the, how they're parented, but also then how they're not educated. When you were saying the business degrees were the thing when we were going yeah, in the through. '80s, everybody wanted MBA, CPA, because yeah. MBA is still buy a degree, but um, yeah. but we found an alternative for um, you know we've got kind of one aspiring that wants to be in business, mm-hmm. um, but it's a it's a one year um, like college alternative program. It's called Praxis, is what it's called, mm-hmm. yeah. and and basically it's a you do, I don't remember how many weeks of, of online, you know, instruction first, right. but then you're paired up with a, with a startup that, mm-hmm. that needs whatever it is, marketing yeah. or, you know, you right. know, administrative kind of things, right. um, secretarial, whatever technology. And then you're paired up with them and you do your internship and something like 80 or 85% of the, the companies that you're paired mm-hmm. up with end up hiring you at the end of that year. Hmm. And so it's basically, but it's in a, like an apprenticeship, but it's for, for right. business stuff where you would, right. and in most, like when I went into retail, my, my employer explicitly said to me when we started, I don't, I'm, I don't want somebody who's been trained in retail. Mm-hmm. That's why I like you because you don't, you're, you're a hobbyist, you're but a you're not. Slate. Yeah. So I can teach you how we do business here. Right. I'm like, I understand. Yeah. Perfect. Right. right. I'm happy to learn. So I think that's the way. And then I, but I also was like, wait a minute, why did I just spend four years in college? Right. <laughs> right no 100 percent. because i could have just started four years ago and well, i would we have could been... say the same thing about coming out of seminary coming out of yeah seminary, seminaries are not seminary. actually prepared to be a pastor no it is a trade school but it's yes. maybe not um but it's still it's it's lacking a lot of the practical trade nothing can prepare you for combat except no. combat yeah that's true nothing can prepare you for ministry except ministry and that's a bump and a bruise that you learn almost you know after the honeymoon period wears off or you're an associate pastor let's say it's almost like a seminary or whatever kind of trade uh, military training it's Mm -hmm. just like okay how can we prevent this person from dying right away (laughs) right (laughs) so that they can learn something basic training what you're trying to do is instill that sense of esprit de corps that i'll die Mm -hmm. for my brothers you're not going to war to kill people you're going to war to kill people to protect your brothers Mm -hmm. the person on your left and right originally that's what seminary was for too it was to instill in you the sense of the church is your brothers and sisters. The, cler- the, the fraternity of other clergy, these are your brothers. And that's what Winkles were invented for. Yeah. And that, that sense of fraternity and being brothers in arms is completely gone for the most part nowadays. Because every yeah. pastor, when they get into their congregation, it becomes this little fiefdom. Because every congregation is different, has different personalities, different polity, all that, Right. Yeah. And nothing can prepare you for parenting, exactly, except parenting. You say my nobody friend, grows up until you become a parent. No really. kidding. My yeah. friend who, when until he had his to. first child, the doctor gave him a book. <laughs> and, and the book said how to parent a child. And he opened it, and it was blank pages. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Good, good for that doctor. And I that's like the it. point, is that no book, no other parent, nobody can tell you how to parent your own children, except just the bare, and this goes back to wisdom then. Because in the moment, as a parent, as a new pastor, whatever it might be, the emotional shock. Yeah. W- the when you fir- remember your first child when they said, "Okay, you can go home now." My first thought was, um, "With the child?" Well, yeah, of mine course. Were, I'm like, mine were all born at home except for one. So. Okay. 
I don't even well, know what you that didn't means. Have far to go. But, <laughs> I'm like, but for us, home. when yeah. the doctor said, okay, you can put Owen in the car seat and you can take him home, my first thought was panic. I'm like, you do realize I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm a terrible well, driver. And <laughs> yeah, just everything. At that moment, the law just latches onto you like yeah. a wolverine, like a honey badger. And all of these things, like, we're never going to get home. The baby, he's going to suffocate in his car seat. It's going to be too cold, too hot. We can't take him outside. It's January. Well, fine. Just let the, let the state raise your child then. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but that's the thing is then there are so many people that will tell you how to be a parent to your child. But in your heart of hearts, when the law latches onto your heart and just squeezes, none of that. You know, at the end, none of these people can actually help you parent this child. This child is made out of glass. He will shatter mm. at any moment if I do mm. even the smallest thing wrong. And you go in and you poke them to make sure they're still alive while they're sleeping and all that happens with the first child. And that's but the then wisdom you learn that comes, you're actually more fragile than they are. <laughs> way more fragile. But yeah. what you learn then is that the emotions of the first child, they are tamped by the time of the second and then further tamped by the third. And by the time you get to the fourth and the fifth, you're like, eh, they're fine. <laughs> Or tenth, rub some dirt in on it. Go rub some dirt on it and walk it off. But are you bleeding? It, yes. Do you want a band aid? Yes. Okay. Are we good? We're good. Right. Can a band aid cover it? Then we're fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. And luckily, uh, my wife's a nurse, and so we stitch it. Although she has stitched me up way more than all five of my children combined. Now they so, just do the glue, right? I mean, yeah, we use so. the Elmer's glue and butterfly and a couple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just get some thread and just zip, zip, zip. So I have no scars. So, <laughs> but um. That's wisdom. It is, again, experience divorced from the emotions of the moment. Yeah. But you have to go, th- that means you have to live through this stuff first, get through it, then live a little bit more. Then when you have that emotional detachment, you can then learn from those moments. Well, and I, you know, to apply it theologically, I've had this happen to me multiple times here recently where mm-hmm. someone has a question, right? Yeah. And then I'm like, okay, uh, you know, Maybe here's an article from a Lutheran confession, right? Mm-hmm. One of our confessions that, that explicitly talks about it. And it's wisdom, right? It's recorded yeah. uh, wisdom of many generations, 10, 20 mm-hmm. generations, right? Um, uh, and then the reformers and their um, experience in that, in that moment and, and, you know, burning away some of the chaff of the spirit doing that. Um, but then I present it to somebody else and they're like, they don't see it as wisdom. Right. Because their experience doesn't correspond to, to what's right. being talked about. It's like, you know. Um, we, we, well, that's been our, uh, kind of, I suppose, struggle when we were talking about like, how do we interact with a, with a health mandate? Yeah. It's like, who are we going to look back to? Who's going to say, Oh, look, we're going to have a health mandates that are going to go around the whole world and they're going to be applied in every community. And you're going to be obliged to, to, you know, conform to these things without right. any kind of law or legal yeah. force. And you're, you're just, and people are just going to do it. Right. It's like, there's no precedent. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe smaller ones in some totalitarian right. kind of setups, but... But that's the thing, and then, to segue it into theology, is wisdom is law and gospel, because wisdom technically is Jesus, according to Paul, anyways. Mm-hmm. That's Jesus right. For us, wisdom, the wisdom of God. and justification. Yeah. So, when Christ is preached, and faith receives Christ, you are, wi- you are a godly, wise person. You're wise in the way of God's wisdom. What you're talking about is, again, left-hand kingdom stuff, earthly stuff. So it's always going to be wisdom in the way of the law, Mm -hmm. which means that there is actually never going to be an answer because that's the Lex Eterna, the the eternal law of like, no, you're never going to find somebody who's going to satisfy you with an you know. That was our, that's been your conversation on and off for years now with, as you converse with the Stoics. Yeah, right. Is it, it is wisdom, but it has its limit. (laughs) Right. It's like, well, I can befriend death. I can get comfortable with my death. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change the fact that I can't get out from underneath death. No, you can't avoid it. I'm going to befriend this lion. You do realize when he gets hungry, he's still going to eat you, right? Yeah, we'll take our chances. We'll just fully embrace the relationship you have with the lion. Right. I mean, I think if I love the lion and show him that I respect him and and give him deference, he won't eat me. And then he eats you because that's what lions so, do. So what you're <laughs> arguing for is, is, is keeping the, some categorical distinction here between... 100%. Because uh, especially within our vocations, that's God's foxiness, is to... Well, I just preached on this, that the hidden God. I, I talked about God hides himself. It's in Psalm 27. Mm-hmm, and yeah. in, in the one-year lectionary, it's two Sundays in a row that you do the psalm. So the, second, the first Sunday was all forgiveness. The second one was... Or no, oh, yeah. You'd half and yeah. half. That's right. Yeah. And so I did the second Sunday with Psalm 27 where the psalmist prays, God, do not hide yourself from us, from me. 
So I asked, why would God hide himself from us? And mm -hmm. Jesus actually covers this in like Luke, where he says, it says he would not entrust themselves. He would not entrust himself to them because he knew their hearts. Uh -huh. And so God must hide. You himself. can't handle the truth. That's right. Literally. Because what would they do? They wanted to make him their king as soon as he fed them. <laughs> they wanted to seize him by force and uh, coronate him king of Israel because he gave them a free lunch. So going that's how back easy to the we temptations are. Temptations of Satan that we discussed <laughs> with the Karamazov episodes. Yeah, uh, that's the first one. We never even make it past the first uh, temptation. Oh, you're what just going to take care of our material on these? I good got, enough. I got two more temptations. No, we're fine. We're good. Just yep. this is good. <laughs> you you can be our god. That's good. Right. Really? Just a chili cook-off? That's all it took? Yeah, we're fine. It was good so chili. So then within the church, you have both of those forms of wisdom running parallel because you mm. want the elderly to teach the youth not only godly wisdom. Hey, this is Jesus and the Lord's Supper. You need The wisdom this. of faith, yes. The wisdom of faith, but also the wisdom of, hey, Love. just so you yeah. know, I got a lot of miles on these wheels. Let me tell you about life. Let me tell you about getting married. Let me tell you about raising kids. Let me tell you about just being an elder or a trustee. I mean, even just like planting a garden. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's actually a life skill, by the way. It's a, <laughs> Maybe it's a, increasingly yeah. so. But now right? my wife and I have to teach boomers how to raise gardens, how to raise herbs, how to eat a certain way, how to preserve yeah. food. They don't know. And I'm like, how do you not know? You're the generation that was born in. The well, generation. and to raise children. And I was yeah. thinking about this this morning is like. I'm seeing just these catastrophes, right? Yeah. Where the oh, children yeah. are Dude, are being completely encapsulated. You know what's been happening behind the scenes in my church. Right. Well, <laughs> no, but I'm seeing children just being held captive. Not even just adults, but children being... And I know, you right. know, it's only going to well, take a year. because their house is a mess. Right. It's going to take a year or a couple years, and those parents are going to come to me and say, what did I do? And right. like, you didn't do what I told you. <laughs> God willing, it's only a couple of years and not a decade or after the kids leave the house. Well, Yeah. As, like, as I say, after the I they usually wait till the pin is pulled. You know how, here. like every week, I was saying, pray with your children. Here's here. I'm even going to give you, like, just do this, right? Yeah. I give it to you every week, mm -hmm. and you didn't do it. Mm -mm. And I'm, I'm right. telling you, this is this is wise. This is yeah. uh, this is not just a. It is a tradition. It's one that yeah. we we've received. Mm -hmm. uh, ancient Israel did it. I mean, this is not new at all. Right. Is it? And actually, it's commanded. So. Mm -hmm. You decided to go the other way, and right. now look at the consequence. Well, know? I think that's also the importance of literacy then, going back to wisdom in the left-hand kingdom. When you read multiple sources of wisdom, again, like you read the Hagakure in the East, mm -hmm. but then you read about Beowulf in the West, and then you read Tolkien and how Lord of the Rings creates this new warrior code from the best of the old mm -hmm. Germanic pagan ways and Christian ethics. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, it seems like earthly wisdom across cultures is the same. Almost as if there's some sort of objective standard for good and evil and virtue and vice. Then you start to recognize that there is wisdom. And it's shared by every culture, even cultures that never came in contact with each other. So maybe... Call it natural law if you want. Yeah, call it natural law if you want. But there's something there that is natural. And it is demanding on us within our individual vocations, which is, this is the way that you're supposed to live. And we all know this by mm. nature. So maybe maybe that's why the drugs are so necessary because that's Correct. because of the, the cognitive dissonance that's mm. caused by like trying to go against nature. Right. I posted a food chart today on my Instagram, my personal Instagram profile. Um, breakfast cereals, pre-sweetened <laughs> breakfast cereals. You put it on Telegram too. Oh, did I? Yeah. Are above meat and eggs I saw for nutrition. That. Like, like I don't even know what to say. Like, like literally, Skittles, frosted flakes. Frosted wasn't flakes. it? Skittles were declared unedible by a court. This past. I mean, week. even even watermelon should not be at the top. Correct. Kale. I can see kale. I mean, there's there's almost no nutrients in kale. Yes. Mm, that's not true. Chlorophyll, but <laughs> <laughs> you need chlorophyll. Go for spinach, baby. Uh, yeah, spinach would probably be better. I, kale is more robust. It lasts longer in the fridge. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it is the mud fish of vegetables, love leafy greens. <laughs> but yes, frosted mini weeds, yeah. unsweetened almond milk. Do they yeah. even know how that's made? Almond milk. You know, almonds don't have nipples. I don't know if people are aware of this. Yeah, I'm aware of this. You, you can't milk an almond. And so this is a great point because I, I saw this. Somebody else, a friend of mine posted this. 
the plant-based milk you're drinking is literally made in a plant. It's not about like the leafy green thing. It's literally that building over there called a plant. That's where they make that milk. So, so you had ground beef, cheddar cheese, whole egg fried in butter at the bottom. Like this right. is my regular diet. It's like what I'm not supposed to be eating right. according to this to be minimized. Right. Notice mm. all the things at the top loaded with estrogen and soy. Soy estrogen. Loaded mm. with plastics, loaded with chemicals and fillers. Well, not dates. Dates are okay. Yeah. As almond far as fruit juice. goes. You can't juice it Alm- either. Ugh, unsweetened almond milk. I don't even know. Lucky Charms is like in the middle. It's like Should Ron Swanson said. Moderated. Skim milk is water lying about being milk. So this comes out of Tufts University, Gerald J. and Dorothy R. Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Mm-hmm. We need to encourage people to eat more kale, watermelon, and frosted mini wheats. Why? What? Because it makes you dumber. <laughs> it literally affects your brain. It affects your body. And <laughs> that's why on the way home today, I was call texting my wife. Juice. I ate like a half a pound of beef yesterday. <laughs> and so this morning, <laughs> I rolled like I rolled like a champion this morning because I'm like between the beef and all the other things I, I consumed yesterday, I was on top of my game. My coach was complimentary, which is super rare for my coach to compliment anybody, let alone multiple times. So I'm like, from now on, before I train, I got to eat a half a pound of beef and eggs. And my wife, who has a lot of medical conditions, that's a part of what keeps her like literally cap- like able to do oh anything. i know multiple people that do carnivore diet now yeah just because they whatever it is that was in all the other stuff yep. i mean That's maybe it just over time it just mm-hmm. like destroyed things yeah. like metabolism and yep. yeah and so for health. her it's necessary but i texted back and i said this is why they don't want us eating meat and 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 pro- Isn't it interesting? Poultry. It's, uh, this is why i'm saying maybe it's hormonal because um it does promote um <laughs> does promote testosterone production so oh, of course it does uh, we don't want men. We can't have men. No. We don't want fully functional 51-year-olds. We need them broken down and retired at 51. On disability? Yeah. With their drugs and video games? Correct. It's perfect. It's perfect. perfect. And Gen X is the generation to fill that bill because we grew up on drugs and video games. <laughs> we were trained from a young age. Right. It's an easy handoff. So when we talk about wisdom, which we're going to talk about with Young Goodman Brown, yeah, think on that as we read this, the whole matter of vocation, and wisdom and the passing on of wisdom because Hawthorne, you could say he's slightly skeptical about the Christian faith of the early colonies, Puritanism in particular. In, yeah, in specific. And so I think this more than any of his other stories really kind of sets the table for you as far as like what his perspective is, his viewpoint on Christianity in the colonies. This is called Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'm just looking at, at bios here. Boy, they, they are the bios are all over the map. Yeah. What does this one say? Uh, this is this is Poetry Foundation, so they're kind of left. Mm-hmm. Considering guilt, actual or imagined, revealed or concealed to be a universal human experience, he traced out his characters, the types and effects of guilt. So they're saying that's the central the central mm-hmm. thing is dealing with the psychology of guilt. Well that what well, that's what happened with the minister's black veil. That's true. That mirror right. of the law that everybody saw themselves. It reflected back at them from that veil. Yeah. It drew okay. out their heart. So there but you also, what is what are some of the key characteristics of Puritan hmm, guilt? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> guilt. It's a guilt-based culture, but also it then, is. are you progressing in your sanctification? Mm-hmm. Where are the works that demonstrate you have faith? Right. That's why you have the halfway covenant, and then the quarter covenant, and then everything else oh yes because we have because we're losing too many people we're losing too many people so we got to rebrand we have to we have to make it a little bit more accessible it's more of a buck and a quarter covenant than a, yeah <laughs> that's good so young goodman brown came forth at sunset into the street at salem village but put his head back after crossing the threshold to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife and faith as the wife was aptly named, (laughs) thrust her own pretty head into the street, letting the wind play with the pink ribbons of her cap while she called to Goodman Brown. He is a Goodman. Yeah, I was going to say, he's aptly named too. Yes. Dearest heart, whispered she softly and rather sadly, when her lips were close to his ear, prithee put off your journey until sunrise and sleep in your own bed tonight. A lone woman is troubled with such dreams, and such thoughts that she is afeard of herself sometimes. Pray tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights in the year. We don't really know what time of year it is yet, do we? Mm-mm, no. no. 
My love and my faith, capital F faith, her name, replied mm -hmm. young Goodman Brown. He is young. This is important. P.S. If you read the Withertongue emails and the fact that I refer to the young pastor constantly, it's actually from this short story. Uh -huh. My love and my faith of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey, as thou callest it, forth and back again must needs be done twixt now and sunrise. What, my sweet, pretty wife, Dost thou doubt me already? And we but three months married? Ooh, they're newlyweds. Mm -hmm. Then God bless you, said Faith, with the pink ribbons. The pink ribbons are important because they're a sign of youth. Okay, so we have lots of this. These are young people. Yes. And may you find all well when you come back. Amen, cried Goodman Brown. Say thy prayers, dear Faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. So they parted. And the young man pursued his way until being about to turn the corner by the meeting house, he looked back and saw the head of faith still peeping after him with a melancholy air in spite of her pink ribbons. Or he's conveying like a, oh, I don't know, a naivete or something, right? Yes. It's yes. like, if only they knew, you know, you, right. you know, that's in the background. Yep. Yeah. If only they knew what was about to happen. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I also like the way they talk. I know it's, I know it's dated. Um, it's fun though, isn't it? Well, it, it's the thing with language because we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we're it's talking etiquette. about like, yeah, we're talking about a lot of cultural shifts and that's one of the things that's lost. And you might say, well, it's not wise. What was it? Oh, I, I was talking to uh, my caddy, my adults that are coming into congregation uh, this week. And I mentioned, you know, how my son was going to, to uh, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I, I told him, I said, you're going to wear that on the plane. You know, you're supposed to wear your suit. And, uh. He didn't know what I was talking about. And they didn't know what I was talking about either. Right. These right. are older folks. And they're like, I'm like, you don't know that like it used to, like you would dress nicely yeah. just to go out, period, yeah. Yeah. but also to go on a plane. Yeah, it was and now deal. it's like, what's what's the what's the complete opposite of this? Oh, they people of their, Walmart. They put their bare feet on your, in between your seat yeah. while they're wearing pajamas. Right. But I was thinking people at Walmart, it's even yeah. worse than going it's on an airplane. people at Walmart who get on planes. That's basically what it's like to fly <sighs> nowadays. Right, but it's also language, um, mm -hmm. and I think the loss of the of the language, you know, language has a way of ordering things, right? Yeah, and so by by losing this, like you called it, etiquette, by losing that etiquette and prop, you know, decorum, say hi, mm -hmm. you know, just even greeting somebody when they yeah. come in the room, and and being, you know, and even the small talk, which mm -hmm. I, I abhor, but only because you know, I don't want to be bored. Right. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> speaking of arrogant, mm -hmm. uh, and just saying what I think. Anyway, that it's a way of ordering the the conversation and and the the way you know the actions, the things that are going to happen, mm -hmm. right? And so here it's like no, between husband and wife, newly newly married, mm -hmm. um, it's important to say these words, right? Because it, it's ordering that relationship, it's keeping mm -hmm. it ordered, actually, right? You know, mm -hmm. and it may seem oh, saying my pretty wife, well, she needs to hear that, right? <laughs> so anyway, that's why I like that language, even no, if it good. is you know a dated version. Because it's setting that tone that th yeah. these people are, um, you know, they're living the married life. And they're, yes. Even with their words. Newly married life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So poor little Faith, thought he, for his heart smote him. What a wretch am I to leave her on such an errand. She talks of dreams, too. Methought as she spoke, there was trouble in her face, as if a dream had warned her what work is to be done tonight. Hmm. But no, no. T'would kill her to think it. Well, she is a blessed angel on earth. And after this one night, I will cling to her skirts and follow her to heaven. <laughs> That's commitment. Remember that commitment? <laughs> yeah. I was also so, thinking this is, um, uh, I don't know if it's a reference, but I think it is uh, to Pilate's wife, right? And Fulman yeah. Pilate had listened to his wife. Right. You know? With this excellent resolve for the future, Goodman Brown felt himself justified in making more haste on his present evil purpose. <gasps> what? Uh huh. It's a present evil purpose. He's more, he feels justified. He's got a hurry. He had Let's taken get it over a, with. Yeah. Right. You know, like well, this is yeah. I love this story. It's so good. <laughs> he had taken a dreary road, darkened by all the gloomiest trees of the forest. Now you get that old Henry vibe from Sleepy Hollow, right? Yeah. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. 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 That gothic kind of horror. Right which barely stood aside to let the narrow path creep through and closed immediately behind. It was all as lonely as could be. And there, 
is this peculiarity in such a solitude that the traveler knows not who may be concealed by the innumerable trunks and the thick boughs overhead, so that with lonely footsteps he may yet be passing through an unseen multitude. Imagine what it was like back then. I grew up on the edge of the Boundary Waters, so I mm -hmm. get a feel for this, that walking into the woods could actually be the last time anyone sees you. It was legitimately dangerous. Yeah. I mean, never mind wild beasts, but you're talking right. about... Well, of course, they were afraid of engines, mm -hmm. right? You can't go in the woods. Why? That's the, the next paragraph. You got ahead of us. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, there's wild beasts, there's Indians, there's demons. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal, too. There were demons in the woods. Because where does the devil play? Back in the, in the colonial days, out in the woods. In the Which dark. goes back to wisdom stories. How do we stop our kids from wandering away, getting lost in the woods, and dying? Well, we, yeah. have, to, we have to tell them these stories. Come back before dark. Exactly. No. Yeah. And also, uh, well, that, I mean, that's even old. Well, is it older? No, it's about the same era, right? The Grimm. The Grimm tales are about the same time, except yeah. from Germany. Yeah. Grimm's were what, mid-1800s? Yeah, that's what I think. Let's see here. Grimm's fairy tales. So they're about the same time, but, you know, with all the stories. Uh, what's the one with the breadcrumbs, you know, all those kind of Hansel tropes? Hansel and Yeah. I should know that. We were just talking about that last night. Uh, my daughter hasn't seen Peter and the Wolf yet or read it. Ooh. So oh. 1812 to 1815, 1819 to 1857. It was okay. revised and enlarged seven times. All right. So, yeah, so s roughly same time period. Yeah. So there may be a devilish Indian behind every tree, said Goodman Brown to himself. And he glanced fearfully behind him as he added, what if the devil himself should be at my very elbow? Hmm. Right. He jumped up on a hickory stump and said, let me show you how it's done. Yep. Crossroads. Yep. His head being turned back, he passed a crook in the road. Oh, we're at a fork in the road now. And looking forward again, beheld the figure of a man in grave and decent attire. Seated at the floor or the foot of an old tree. He arose at Goodman Brown's approach and walked onward side by side with him. Hmm. You are so late. Grave, in... grave as in... What? Serious, severe. S like, this is solemn. serious. Yeah, solemn. This is a oh. serious matter. Okay. And decent, though. He's dressed decently. Hmm. According Me to the conventions of the time. Right, meaning he's not a he's not homeless person. He's not a vagabond. Which Somebody you might listen to. Okay. Right. Yeah. You are late, Goodman Brown, said he. The clock of the Old South was striking as I came through Boston. And that is full 15 minutes agone. Faith kept me back a while replied the young man replied the young man with a tremor in his voice caused by the sudden appearance of his companion though not wholly unexpected and again just the brilliant play on words faith kept me back <laughs> <laughs> it was now deep dusk in the forest and deepest in that part of it where these two were journeying as nearly as could be discerned the second traveler was about 50 years old apparently in the same rank of life as goodman brown and bearing a considerable resemblance to him, though perhaps more in expression than features. So he's 50 years older, but of the same rank, meaning... Uh, not 50 years older, but 50 years, so maybe twice about as old. About 50 years old, so about twice as old, mm -hmm. but the same rank in life. Not rich, not poor, but... Station, we might say. Socioeconomic, yeah, same yeah. station in life. And had a considerable resemblance to young Goodman Brown. Meaning they, they are of the same cloth. They're covered yes. in the same cloth. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Still, they might have been taken for father and son. And yet, though the elder person was as simply clad as the younger, and as simple in manner too, he had no indescribable air of one who knew the world. He had an indescribable air. Oh, I'm sorry. Man, I'm killing it today. He had an indescribable air of one who knew the world, and who would not have felt abashed at the governor's dinner table, or in King William's court, were it possible that his affairs should call him thither. So now we have mm. the comparison of worldly wisdom yeah. and the naivety of youth. Mm -hmm. And yet this 50-year-old guy has, for some reason, traveled all the way past Boston to come up to Salem, down to Salem, over, down, down, Boston, Salem. It's Somebody east west, me. right? East west. There we go. East west. Somebody I tell me so. where Salem is in relation to Boston. 
having not ever lived in Massachusetts and only been to Boston once, I couldn't tell you. Point being, um, though, now we have this I'm, older I'm searching elder. For, I'm getting di- walking directions. Thank you. Because <laughs> I'd like to know how far he traveled. I'm, I'm sure it's, if he included it as a detail, I'm sure it matters. Uh, let's see. Show, st- okay. By driving directions, it's 41 minutes, 21 miles. Okay. So, I mean, that's quite a distance. Um, it looks to be north, uh, northeast of okay. Boston. There we go. Wow. These have some old, I know all these names of these places. Boston's an old I guess Massachusetts is an old place. So the clock of the Old South. Walking would take five hours and 50 minutes, by the way. How long? Five hours, 50 minutes, 16 16 miles. Because it says he came through Boston. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe he came from Cambridge or somewhere else. Sure, but it was a walk. Yeah, half a day or a day. And I think about it just in terms of that means this is serious. Mm -hmm. If he's willing to walk over five hours to meet this guy in the woods... Yeah. And young Goodman Brown lied to his wife about where he was going. Mm-hmm. Then this is serious. Yeah, and Hawthorne's readers wouldn't have known the distance between these two right. Places. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And anybody that lives in Massachusetts or thereabouts. <laughs> so I apologize to all of you. Yes. But the only thing about him that could be fixed upon as remarkable was his staff, which bore the likeness of a great black snake. So curiously wrought that it might also be seen to twist and wriggle itself like a living serpent. Uh-huh. This, of course, must have been an ocular deception assisted by the uncertain light. Now, you know what I like about Hawthorne, and I think you do too, is that he's not hes not ashamed to use what for us now are like very conventional tropes. I don't yes. know if they were in his day. Right. But right. I think they are because they're so, well, as we've noted, they're so biblically based, right? Yes, right. Yeah. So he, he's always likening back to, oh, the serpent on the pole, right? Or that yeah. kind, of, kind of idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So no. is this the devil or is this Moses? No. We don't no. know. Nope. Because does he see himself reflected back in himself because this is the devil? Or is this Moses and the law and therefore he sees himself reflected in this older person because of, again, they share the same rank in life, same kind of demeanor. Right. There's this sense of they're on this. He's on the same path, maybe. But they are literally on the same path together. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. come, Goodman Brown, cried his fellow traveler. This is a dull pace for the beginning of a journey. Take my staff if you are so soon weary. Friend, said the other, exchanging his slow pace for a full stop. Having kept covenant by meeting thee here, it is my purpose now to return whence I came. I have scruples touching the matter thou wotst of. Wotst of? That's an interesting. Yeah, I don't know what that. Declension. Is. It's a, yeah, there's something missing in there, right? Because of the apostrophe. Yeah. Uh, looking, I'm trying to find it. Oh, it's not finding anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sayest thou so, replied he of the serpent, smiling apart. Oh, interesting. Hmm. So you say he said he Now we know what they're talking about. Yeah. Let us walk on, nevertheless, reasoning as we go. And if I convince thee, not thou shalt turn back. We are but a little way in the forest yet. We are going to the center of the garden. They hid from the Lord their God in the middle of the garden. Too far, too far, exclaimed the good man unconsciously resuming his walk. My father never went in the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the day of the martyrs. And shall I be the first of the name of Brown that ever took this path and kept? Such company, thou would say, observed the elder person, interpreting his pause. Well said, Goodman Brown. I have been as well acquainted with your family as with ever a one among the Puritans. And that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather. The constable, when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem. The witch trials, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Oh, help me out. I was going to say, this reminds me an awful lot of The Devil and Daniel Webster. Yep. The Devil and Daniel Webster. Have you ever read that? No. Well, then we'll read it on the show because it is a classic. And the old, old 1930s or 20s movie version of it, it's fantastic. It's like 
you know, it's like a, a movie short almost. It's have, did you ever see the old black and white Telltale? Nineteen forty one, huh? Yeah, that's okay. fantastic. Um, there's a Twilight Zone episode based on it too. That's the best ever. So, let's see. Stephen Vincent Benet. This is a yeah. short story by American writer. Mm -hmm. It was published in Saturday Evening Post. Yes, it was. In 1936. Yep. So that's our next episode, apparently, because huh. that's a fantastic parable. Yeah, I don't know the author. It's interesting, but it's set in the same time period. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's what reminded me of it. Of in the colonies at this time, that was again one of those things of never talk to a man that you meet on the side of the road, mm. because it's probably the devil, and he'll lead you into the woods and take your soul. Apparently, the the uh, devil in Daniel Webster is referred to in Treehouse of Horror four. Okay. The devil in Homer Simpson. Yes. <laughs> So Where Homer good. sells his soul for a donut. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. It's impressive, A, that I know that, and B, it's one of my favorite little things, vignettes. Well, that was back Simpsons. when I watched Simpsons, yeah. Yes, that's the best, though. He goes to hell, and he won't stop eating the donuts, so the devil kicks him out. <laughs> the devil's like, this is supposed to be punishment. He's like, more donut in mouth. He's like, stop. He's like, no, more donut. <laughs> okay. It's the best. So, okay, good. But again, just the, just the warning that in this time that this is set, you don't talk to strangers on the road, especially a guy that you meet sitting under a tree or leaning against a fence. Yeah. Well, and then he went out to meet him. Which, by the way, is ancient, going literally all the way back to prehistory, when mm. Jacob says to the Lord, tell me your name. Oh, I need to so know that, which, Yeah, I need I, to know who you are. Right? I need to know who you are. And then Moses says the same thing at the bush in Midian. Tell me your name. Why? Because I don't know who you are. Right. You know but, who I am. <laughs> well, and so there's the, also this idea then that um, people, we we're talking about wisdom a right. lot, right? And that the idea that, well, no one else has been faced with this, you know, right. challenge before. Right. Or, or, or put in this position before. Yeah. And like, yeah, no, you're, you're actually kind of ignorant here. Right. You know, maybe the faces and names change. Maybe the means or mechanism change. Right. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, you know, like transhumanism isn't a new idea. It's just the right. technology behind it today is, right. is unique. But the idea of like creating master race and transcending mm -hmm. humanity. Well, that's as old as time. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to become God ultimately. Right. Yeah. So they were good friends. They were what's the Quaker woman. There we go. So I helped your grandfather, the constable mm -hmm. when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem. And it was I, by the way, this is also um, used in a very famous song by the Rolling Stones, Sympathy Three for the Devil. They play oh, off of this when they, when they, you know, uh, I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And okay. the, the um, Inquisition is brought up. And, yeah. Are you writing this down? I should put these in the show notes. <laughs> Forgetting what we're talking about. Sympathy for the Devil, Daniel and Daniel Webster. Like okay. I said, I trained this morning, so my brain is on fire. It was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. They were my good friends, both. And many a pleasant walk have we had along this path. And returned merrily after midnight, I would fain be friends with you for their sake. Now, what do we know? We know Goodman Brown left, but remember the, what was the purpose? It was for evil purposes he left his wife and, he and knew lied it. to her. And he knew it, yeah. And he knew it. He meets this man in the woods who has a staff and a serpent that seems to writhe and twist and undulate on the staff. So much so that he brings it up and says, I ain't going to use your staff to support myself as we walk. I don't want to touch it. Then this stranger nope. says, I knew your grandfather and your father, and I helped them burn down villages and, and torture young women. Begs a question. You've been around a long time. You've been around a long time, <laughs> and yet you are only 50 years old? Interesting. Right? Yeah. yeah. So young Goodman Brown... And this is the point. If you knew my father and my grandfather and they were, quote unquote, good Christian men, well now. Then maybe the idea of good Christian men is, the, is a problem. And maybe we now have learned where Donovan got that from. <laughs> yeah. Good Christian people. Also from Flannery O'Connor, good country mm -hmm. people. But oh, yeah. Same idea. I've got to write that down. That's a great parable. We've got to read that one, too. Yeah. I'm, we didn't read it on this show, did we? We I did, yeah, because we, we talked about that and looked it up. And we did. Olga. We had... Yeah. We did good country people. Okay. Yeah, one-legged Olga. That's right. 
That was, that was way back at the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah. Didn't we figure it was like yeah. 2019 or something? So we have good Christian men and we have good man Brown. And yet now the stranger said, oh no, your, your dad and your grandpa, I knew them real well. <laughs> they weren't as good as you think they are. Wickedness or not. Oh wait, sorry, step back. If it be as thou sayest, replied Goodman Brown, I marvel they never spoke of these matters, or verily I marvel not, seeing that the least rumor of the sort would have driven them from New England. We are a people of prayer and good works to boot, and abide no such wickedness. Well, now Goodman Brown has just pointed out that his father and grandfather were hypocrites. Right, and I, I can't help but think of um, uh, recent history, right, the, with the Roman Church. Yes. It's like, well, how could the priests have done that? How could it be so entrapped? How, how could it? And it's generational, right? Right. They've been doing this for a long, for how long? long, and long covering time. this up? Yeah. How could that be? How could we not have known? Surely information would have gotten out. Right. Surely somebody would have said something. Right. Right. And, and of course, this is happening with all the um, conspiratorial elements of, you know, national and global politics. Like, somebody had to have noticed and would have said something. They couldn't well, have kept yeah. it under wraps this well. They right. just inherited it from the mystery cults, the Roman mystery cult. It what, was, the ability to keep secrets? No, the part with the child sacrifice and everything else that you do to them. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose there's ways to kind of deflect the story. And obviously, if you can control the process. Well, I was going to say, when you control 73% of all of the land in Europe in 1500, that helps. Yeah, I suppose. You get things locked down. But also, you well, just eliminate anybody who you know, interferes with the narrative, gets in the way. And back in the day, you could do that by just sending them to Ireland. <laughs> you right. Know? Yeah, so maybe the argument is, um, the reason why it took off, you know, the the, um, the scandals, you know, opened up so quickly and took off is because of uh, internet technology. Yeah. 100%. Because the information could spread, people shared stories, uh, and then, you know, yeah. you could actually collect witnesses very quickly. Right, exactly. People was like, yeah, that priest abused me. Here's my right. story. No, no. Right. Whatever well, that's is. why we've talked about on the show. That's why the little conditional clause was added to marriage vows. If anyone knows of any reason for this marriage not to happen, speak now. Because in the old days, you could literally travel t 10 miles in any direction and just become a different person. And so you would have guys, mm. like I read about this with Luther. He would talk about guys in Saxony who would be married like three times. And he would just go on trips and they would, you know. Hey, they get run out of town because they were abusing their yeah. wife or something, and they just go somewhere yeah. else and abuse somebody just go else. Somewhere else, and literally just traveled right down the road, like with the Salem witch trials. Whatever was happening in Salem, did they know about it in Boston until after the fact? Probably not. Mm. No, no one, and they went on for decades, right? Quite a long time, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's the advantage of being insular is that you can keep things under wraps. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, it feels like spinning plates today. It's like, how are you going to keep all these plates spinning? Because we know You're too not. much. Yeah. We know too much. Yeah. I don't think you can. I think it's going to collapse. Well, that's why you have to control the narrative. Right. But the narrative doesn't even hold up under its own weight. Right. Well, but that's I'm, why you have to create so many different ones that if some collapse in on themselves, you can go like, oh, yeah, that was a conspiracy. Congratulations. You figured that one out. I've got 99 other plates spinning over here that you don't know about. Well, but t twice inoculated and twice boosted and still gets the... the well, but again, like we talked about with How the does boomers, that work? you have generations of indoctrination here. I suppose. Generations. Where reality doesn't have to conform to... Never. Truth? <laughs> never. Okay. It never conforms to them, their, okay. to their viewpoint. No. <laughs> okay, then. Wickedness or not, said the traveler with the twisted staff. Again, just so you're reminded, he has a twisted staff. I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. The deacons of many a church have drunk the communion wine with me. The select, men of, the select men of divers towns make me their chairman. I'm going to explain what divers means to people. Diverse? So, no, divers. It's As in old... like going to the bottom of a lake? No. Like dry. <laughs> like dry. Really? Yeah. It means diverse, yes. But they Multiple, would also many, it numerous. As, okay. Right. What's the etymology? You're talking about the etymology. Yeah. Comes from uh, comes from the old French, from the Latin diverse, but from the from French to turn in separate ways. Right. 
Yeah. So you have these select men of divers towns, diverse, like all these different people in all these different towns. Yeah. They bring me in and they make me the chairman of the town. Secretly, obviously. Secretly. But notice, it's the deacons of the churches who have communed with me. Mm -hmm. And then the select men, that is those who are elected, basically, they make me the chairman. And a majority of the great and general court are firm supporters of my interest. The governor and I too, but these are state secrets. And there, by the way, is the answer to your previous question. Which one? How do they keep these things secret? Control every uh, because authority. Satan, yes. Because Satan eats with lots of different people. This made me think of a hymn. I know this happens, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, and it's not one I sing very often. It's actually Melanchthon's hymn. It's, I think it's the only one from Melanchthon in the hymnal. It's yeah. called uh, Lord God to Thee We Give All Praise, 522 in our hymnal. Uh, Lutheran service book, but uh, where did wh what's the stands I was looking for? Uh, dun, 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 dun. It has good stuff in it, like talking about ancient dragons and things. Mm -hmm. um, Roaring lion. Uh, where it, he talks about church and state. There it is. As he talking about the devil of yeah. old deceived the world and into sin and death has hurled. So now he subtly lies in wait to undermine both church and state. There you go. Nice. What is that? Wait a minute. That's Philip Melanchthon. <laughs> there we go. He divides the Christian people in the previous stanza by undermining both church and state, according to Melanchthon. Yeah. Interesting. What's the name of that again for our listeners? 522, Lord God, we give thee all praise, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Good. I should have bookmarked it. What am I doing? I should put it in the show notes. I was going to say, you got a lot of show notes to do, my friend. Ah, no. You should take notes and then make, I don't have to do the work. There's that too. <laughs> What am I? Am I the producer? You or are not. You okay. are. So produce. All right. Wickedness or not, then I have very general acquaintances here in New England. Deacons of churches, select men have made me the chairman of their town. A majority of great and general court, that is judges. The governor and I are very familiar. I know a lot of state secrets. I'm basically and I'm the in biggest charge. one of them all, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can this be so? Cried Goodman Brown with a stare of amazement at his undisturbed companion. How be it? How be it I have nothing to do with the governor and council? They have their own ways and are no rule for a simple husbandman like me. So he's a husbandman. There we go. Now we know what he does. Mm -hmm. But here I too go on with thee. How should I meet the eye of that good old man, our minister, at Salem Village? Oh, his voice would make me tremble both Sabbath day and lecture day. I might feel guilty for what I'm doing. Thus far, the elder traveler had listened with due gravity, but now burst into a fit of irrepressible mirth, shaking himself so violently that his snake-like staff actually seemed to wriggle in sympathy. It's alive. Ha, 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 shouted he again and again, then composing himself. Well, go on, Goodman Brown, go on, but prithee, don't kill me with laughing. <laughs> Meaning, I know your priest. Uh-huh. I, I, I know your and, minister. And he knows um, yeah. the ability for people to live the double life, right? Right, exactly. Because lots of practice, obviously, teaching people to right. do this, but right. it's, like, it, it's readily available. You can live that kind of dissonant character. Right. Which yeah. makes you wonder, within the context of this, of this story then, is this how he lures all of these people into the woods? Mm. I'm going to show you something, and it's good. I'm going to reveal... I'm going to give you wisdom going back to our original conversation. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to pull the veil back and show you the truth. Yeah. And you That'll... need to see this. Because why else would young naive husbandman, newly wedded Goodman Brown, why would he go off on such an evil path? Cuz he's a good man. He wouldn't choose evil just for right. the sake of it. Right, but like we talked about last time, the last show, mm -hmm. um you know, you're willing to go along with quite a bit um, if it satisfies, you know, what you like need. Your curiosity. Well, curiosity, but not just that. Like, if you have the what, what were the three things? Power, authority, and uh, power, Mi mystery, 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 miracle, author and authority. Mystery, miracle, and authority. Mm -hmm. But if those things are satisfied for you, yeah, enough, then 
you'll you'll go along with 100%. like hundred percent. Yeah. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? <laughs> no, just ninety nine percent. Well then, to end the matter at once, said Goodman Brown, considerably nettled. <laughs> That's a great word, nettled. Isn't it? Yeah. There is my wife Faith. It would break her dear little heart, and I'd rather break my own. Nay, if that be the case, answered the other, e'en go thy ways, Goodman Brown. I would not for twenty old women, like the one hobbling before us, that Faith should come to any harm. This is about you, my good man, not her. Uh -huh. I'm not going to hurt her. As he spoke, he pointed his staff at a female figure on the path, in whom Goodman Brown recognized a very pious an exemplary dame who had taught him his catechism in youth and was still his moral and spiritual advisor jointly with the minister and deacon gookin i marvel truly that goody cloyce should be so far in the wilderness at nightfall said he but with your leave friend i shall take a cut through the woods until we have left this christian woman behind being a stranger to you, she might ask whom I was consorting with and whither I was going. Hmm. That's so great. <laughs> so this is the woman that catechized me that's still my moral and spiritual advisor, and she is with the minister and Deacon right. Gookin. These but let, are, let's, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's go off the path here so that she doesn't see you with me. Right. I can, now, I'll, how I'll would she you. know who he... Oh, I didn't uh, actually oh, explain who what? he is to her. What? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. But also, in the next breath, I wonder why these people are out in the woods in the, right before nightfall. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why is this old woman and the minister and one of the deacons out in the woods right at nightfall? And I, I know it seems like, I don't know, just some kind of medieval almost piety where it's yeah. like that you pray. Uh, even that even that one, you know, I pray the Lord my soul, you know, to take yeah. if I should die before I wake. And I'm like, yeah. oh. That's so morbid, and mm -hmm. oh, and that we would ask the angels to watch over us while we sleep. Right. It's like, I mean, it's not just a, it's not just an old trope, but it's like, no. when does you're not send gonna, your holy angel that the evil fo foe may have no power over me, right? But I mean, you're tormented by dreams, mm -hmm. right? Whether they're from your own psyche or from demons or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's not just that. I mean, it's like, I. And, By the well, way, unless you have, unless you have no shame. In Bible study, just to cut you off. I brought this up in Bible study. We have completely abandoned the tradition of God giving us oracles through dreams. Yeah, I know. I know. It's true. Because Zechariah again. Zechariah right. had several of them. But anyway, well, sorry. I've mentioned this. Uh, I don't remember what context. I, I got this from um, John Kleinig, but mm -hmm. uh, Australian theologian. But yeah, he's, he, he, he advised me in some context. If, you, uh, if you're woken up in the night by a dream, then the, you're being called to pray. Right. I'm like, 100%. Okay. Makes sense, whether by the demon or by by the spirit. I mean, it exactly. doesn't, at that point, it doesn't matter. You it's pray. still law. <laughs> it's whether it's the demon or the Holy Spirit. It's still the law saying, no, "Get up but and I, get it." But it's in the scriptures too. I mean, the sin yeah, is done under the cover of darkness. It's yes. done behind closed doors. I mean, right. this that's what was so funny about all this stuff talking about. It was it was presidents and politicians, mm -hmm. you know, who said, "Well, I, you know, we're not going to get involved in what's done behind closed doors, mm -hmm. but, you know, under the bed sheets or something." You're like. That's where sin happens. <laughs> exactly. So, in my experience, I mean, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, that you say that you have no legislative authority over what happens under the cover of darkness, behind closed doors, or in the bed sheets is kind and of yet means yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a trope, but it's also true. I mean, that's the thing. But to this day, you and I both, if we walk into a restaurant, a store, a cafe, the gas station, especially if we're if we have our collars on, mm -hmm. people snap too. <laughs> like, no, or like, they run. <laughs> or they run, 100%, right? That happens in uh It's like yeah, somebody told me the joke last Sunday, why do you always take two Baptists on a camping trip? I don't know. So that the one won't, because the one has to hold the other accountable so that they don't drink. Oh, okay. Because if go. there's just one Baptist with you on a camping trip, they'll drink. Mm -hmm. But if there's two, they'll hold each other accountable. I got it. It's funny. I didn't think it was funny, but... It, it, to the point, it's like when you meet a member of your congregation and they've got three jugs of wine in their shopping cart and a loaf of bread. And you're like, oh, you're shopping? No, nah, I just had to pick some stuff up. I'm on my way out now. And you're like, um, you have three gallons of wine and a loaf of bread. What exactly are you doing? <laughs> like, well, at least they're gallons own, instead like, of boxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let that trend die. <laughs> There's a pastor judging me over my boxed wine. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. 
<laughs> it's it's just plastic bags of wine. <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, when did you quit on life? <laughs> Boxed wine and Uggs. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> Pajama pants. Right? Oh. So be it so, said his fellow traveler. Betake you to the woods and let me keep the path. Hmm, you go hide in the woods. I'm not going anywhere. Accordingly, the young man turned aside, but took care to watch his companion who advanced softly along the road until he had come within a staff's length of the old dame. She, meanwhile, was making the best of her way, with singular speed for so aged a woman, and mumbling some indistinct words, a prayer, doubtless, as she went. The traveler put forth his staff and touched her withered neck with it what seemed the serpent's tail. The devil! screamed the pious old lady. Then Goody Cloyce knows her old friend, observed the traveler, confronting her and leaning on his writhing stick. Hmm. So he knows her, too. Yeah, it seems like she's not so uh, enamored with him anymore. Well, now we know who he is. She called him out. Yeah. But, but yeah, also, well. so my grandpa and my dad were intimately acquainted with this man. Apparently, my minister is, along with governors, judges, city councilmen. My cat, my teacher, and now my, my catechist slash moral and spiritual advisor also seems to know. And him. my deacon, yeah, hmm. yeah. Interesting. Like I said, I think you get a pretty good uh, perspective of Hawthorne's attitude toward Puritanism in the colonies. Not so well, and I think I think what it is is it's. Um, uh, we've talked about. I mean, it's sin that's unconfessed. Is it's... sin that's unconfessed? Sin that's unforgiven. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Because because they're refusing to acknowledge it. Yes, and uh, hiding it. Right. Right. And and you know, and he's in a parabolic way saying, "You've already right. then chosen, you know, right. who you're following and who right. you listen to." So to your point, I sent you the second sermon that I wrote yesterday. Mm -hmm. I did the... think. I was like, wait a minute, didn't I already get one for? Trinity Six? Yes. I thought I did. There's yeah, the okay. one that I wanted to write, and then there's the one the good Lord gave to me mm -hmm. that just blew out of me yesterday. So the question has come up. This is how you act like a Christian. <laughs> right. And this was brought to me. And it's caused no amount of marital strife as a consequence. We need to behave as if we are Christians. Even though they are Christians. But they've been told by an outside advisor, counselor, you need to behave like Christians and tell X, Y, Z. To which I said in response, that's absurd and stupid. You either yeah. are a Christian or you are not. But you cannot behave like a Christian and be a Christian. And so this Sunday's sermon is, what makes a Christian a Christian? Very simple. Good. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think, and I bring it up here too within the context of Young Goodman Brown because it fits, but also I think it's important in the Lutheran tradition we talk about learning from Dr. Martin Luther that you should preach through the catechism three or four times a year. That's his advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wonder though in 2022... Actually, and it's like Walther said once a year, but yeah. yeah. Okay. But I'm just wondering in 2022 if it wouldn't behoove us as clergy to also preach on what makes a Christian a Christian two or three times a year. Just break it down to its absolute fundamental simplest. Isn't, isn't that what the catechism is? Mm. It is, but I think we get lost in the catechism because yeah. it's our tradition. It's our birthright. We tend to not respect it. We talked about this with the Albrecht Peters episodes, which we oh, should yeah. go back to him this fall. I think we should go back to Albrecht Peters. It's solid stuff. I was looking at uh, on the prayer. I was like, wow. Yeah. But my point is then we don't, again, have this tradition of, let's just assume, going back to what you said about CFW Walther, always preach as if you're preaching to convert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you're preaching to sinners. And Luther says this in the bondage of the will. The more the old Adam hears the word of God, the more rebellious he becomes. So you have these dual experiences, phenomena happening in church. One, you have the Holy Spirit calling and gathering us in for the sake of faith, preaching to faith, creating faith, but simultaneously we're sinners, we're selfish, we're self-centered. We're, so we're, we're saying amen while simultaneously rejecting the word that we're saying amen to, right? And so as a consequence, I think it's important for clergy to just take a step back and assume nobody in church actually knows what makes a Christian a Christian, no matter how well catechized, 
no matter how well you preach on this subject. Well, they don't even agree on the on the reason or purpose that they are there in the first place. That's what I mean. Exactly. Yes. Like the, the I mean, for some, it's like it, place. yeah, it's like well, some they come because it's tradition. Some because the parents made them. Some come, you know, some come to confess their sins and be forgiven. Yes, thank God. Exactly. You yes. know, um, some come to 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 be taught. Right. I guess to gain some knowledge mm -hmm. or wisdom of God's right. word, which is edifying. Right. But but you know, we would suggest the central purpose is for that forgiveness of right. sins. And that's what it, you know, that's the heart and center of what it means to be right. a Christian. Which There's no confession I, and forgiveness here in the pure, correct. in this setting. No. no. None. No, because you're striving. That's the word they use all the time in their literature, striving, striving, Well, striving. so where's Jesus in it, is then the question. You're trying to reach him. You're striving toward him. Okay. This is very late, late medieval Roman Catholic piety. Jesus on the rainbow bridge with the sword coming out of his mouth. So, I mean, I don't know enough about Puritan history, but it's, it seems like, like... Um, that that accusation that Luther went mm -hmm. not far enough is actually that Luther went too far, correct? <laughs> you too know, and we need to, it, yeah, we got to back up a little bit because people right. are becoming degenerate again, right? Okay. Election is a well, as Erasmus said, we can't teach election to the common people; they'll become morally degenerate. And I and I appreciate the idea that you know we don't want moral degeneracy around us, <laughs> okay? But you what? have to ask the question: like, what are the means? That, that God has promised to provide to correct that, right? I mean, or how does he address it? Well, this is why Paul is careful to point out that we have been given the mind of Christ, but we're still in the flesh. Mm -hmm, right. The sarks, as he calls it, is not the soma. The flesh is not the body. Mm -hmm. So we may belong to Jesus, but our body belongs to Satan. <laughs> yeah. And it's not Satan who captivates us. We willingly offer it to him, as is pointed out in this short story, this parable. And so that's why I think it's important to constantly come back to the fundamentals of the faith because where else are they getting the fundamentals? They're not getting them at home anymore. You're not being catechized by um, Goody Cloyce. Right. You don't have deacons who are kind of available. Well, no, in, and what, you know, what was it that, that he appreciated about Goody? That she was the moral and spiritual advisor, but it's mm -hmm. not, it's not um, gospel, right? It's still not the no, gospel. No. At least not for these It's these how to folks. live a good life. Mm-hmm. Right. Believe so the in God, spirit, this, belong to this, this church, behave yourself. Right. I mean, it's almost synonymous then, like your morality is your spirituality. 100%, 100%, no. to this day. No. But you'll notice then that that's the old Adam's religion because it persists. I've been here 15 years. <laughs> Most people in this congregation, because it's in every single sermon, know what baptism is for and why it's important. Right. And after 15 years, some have gotten it. There are still other people who have been here with me 15 years who reject it altogether. That can't be it, Pastor. That can't be it. It's too, it's too easy. Because, to your point, if you tell people that, they're just going to go out and sin. To which well, I, I point found, out, well, that's what they do naturally. I, don't have I to found that them. it's not that it's too easy, although that's true too, um, but that it's too narrow. Yeah. yeah so, it's way so too it's specific. Like, right. So it's like, well, okay, I hear what you're saying about baptism, but aren't there other ways? Right. And what about the people who are generally good? I mean, this is the, the Roman yeah, church, right? Uh, you know, yeah. Aristotle, I mean, he was pretty wise. He was yeah, close to God. The righteous pagan. Right, yeah. So what about them? Or what about the people who never hear, right? Like, always. What about yeah, them? It's, it's always that. And so then it's like, okay, we're going to take this narrow, the narrow gate, as Jesus <laughs> describes himself. Yeah. Right? And, and we're going to make it wide, right? Well, he has something to say about people who make Jesus the gate wide. Jesus and his words. Ugh. I know. Too much. If we only had the scriptures and not the New Testament, it would be so much easier. <laughs> right. Oh, wait. So we, they, there is a religion that does that. Yes, you there could, is. You could join it to the, today. Just a little snip, and you're good to go. Oh, yeah. So, Goody Close knows her old friend, Observe the Traveler, confronting her and leaning on his writhing stick. I just love the stick. It's so fantastic. It, it keeps changing. Yes. Just like the devil. Mm -hmm. He becomes all things to all people. Ah, forsooth, and is it your worship indeed, cried the good dame. <gasps> capital your, capital worship. This is like the Grand Inquisitor now, the divine spirit of the earth. I'm giving him a title, yeah. And is it your worship indeed, cried the good dame. Yea, truly is it, and in the very image of my old gossip, Goodman Brown, the grandfather of the silly fellow that now is. Oh, oh. Just insulted the dude who worships the ground you walk on. Oops. Yep, I know you. This silly fellow. But would your worship believe it? 
My broomstick hath strangely disappeared, stolen, as I suspect, by that unhanged witch, Goody Cory, and that too when I was all anointed with the juice of smallage and sink foil and wolf's bane. She's a Everybody's witch. so good. <laughs> She's the other witch. witch stole my stole my, right. my broomstick. So uh, this is a homeschooler alert. I'm going to explain to you what the broomstick means in witchcraft. Uh, so three, two, one. Okay. okay. Fine. So in the original Germanic practices, which stretched all the way into the colonies, when you go out and you have your witch's coven on your Black Sabbath, you strip naked. All the mm. women strip naked. They take copious amounts of drugs. And they jump on top of the broomstick vertically, not horizontally. I got it. And so the myth was that it looked like they were flying because, of course, the broom handle would keep them bouncing off the ground. That's where the myth comes from of the witch on the, on the broom. Okay, smallage is celery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just wondering what it was. Yeah. Sink foil and wolves bane is a herbaceous plant of the rose family, mm -hmm. five petaled uh, yellow flowers, mm -hmm. also known as pon po potentilla, hmm. like potent. Yeah. Also known as potentilla erecta. That's Oof. a nice name. Well, we know what that's for. Some refer to it as barren strawberries. Barren strawberries. My goodness. Yeah. Etymology. Oh man, it's there's all sorts and, of stuff. And of course, here. good old wolves bane. Uh, it has lots of history. Yes, it is being used for things. Yeah. All right. So these are herbals. They are herbals. Isn't that yes. interesting that it's connected to witchcraft? Yes. Well, again, if you want to control people, and you also want to control the way they behave and think, of, and remember when they quote unquote missionized and baptized a lot of Germanic peoples back in the day, it yeah. wasn't by choice that they converted. So everything about their culture, uh, polygamy, we talked about before, you got to demonize polygamy. You got to demonize herbal medicines and folk medicines. You got to demonize yeah. their, 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 again, um, my great grandmother was a missionary and her parents were missionaries in Montana. She was in South Dakota. And when they moved in and they set up their hospital slash schoolhouse slash orphanage, they cut all their hair, all the Native Americans hair. They taught them to speak English and wear suits and boots. Everything about their previous culture was forbidden. Their food was forbidden. Everything was forbidden. You're now an American, and so you will behave like an American. And that means being a Christian. It was an incredibly oppressive experience. Right. And so, but my point was, I was just thinking about herbage. You mm -hmm. know, we both referred to the herbal practices of our spouses yeah. as, yes. as witchcraft. Um, well, I, again, I live jokingly. in a small village on the edge of a wood, and my yeah. wife, <laughs> yeah. She brews things. She um, brews and tinctures and whatever yes. the um uh, but the point was it's it's not so much the thing itself that's the problem correct it's the use of it exactly it's a tool right that god right. provided for us it's all first i mean first like a broomstick i mean you, sh you can have a broomstick I mean, that's not a problem it's not gonna make right. you a witch it's a handle depending on how you use it until you start to use it yes yeah yeah yeah. And so these herbs are the same way. And so to just right. say, well, er, you know, herbology is, is uh, witchcraft. And you're like, right. mm, I guess used for false worship. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, too, the other thing is that, again, all witches' covens were sex cults. They <laughs> kind of that. scrubbed that from the histories. Oops. Yeah, just a bunch of witches. No, it's a sex cult. That's why it's. I get it in the movies. Women. It's in the movies. Some. Like Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, there was that one. What was the other one? Um. There was a show on Fox for a while. I watched it. It was terrible. Coven? Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> no, actual TV show called Coven? No, it wasn't that oh. one, but it, it dealt with like all... It had like Sleepy... It was called Sleepy Hollow. That's it. Oh, okay. It had some of it. Wasn't it like a guy from the present went to the past or... Yeah. From the present right. went to the past. I thought like, it had a clever, uh, clever that, premise. Uh, what's that other show that's like that Outlander or something? Yeah. Anne watches that. Okay. I don't know. She read the books, so... Okay. There we go. I get it's it. It's a thing. It's a yeah. thing. Yeah. My wife and my daughter watch Downton Abbey so they can mock it. <laughs> it's like MST3K when they watch it. I'm like, why are you watching this if you're making fun of it? They're like, because we like it. Well, like, you've mocked Victorian everything for so long. Well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> it's indoctrination. <laughs> so Goody Corey's a witch, as is, well, apparently, <laughs> apparently Goody Cloy's too. <laughs> so the women of the village, they're witches. The deacons and the minister... 
they're intimately familiar with the devil, as are his parents. And, and Goodman Brown's grandfather. No wonder the devil looks like him. Cause but wait, there's more. Yeah. And this, again, imagine the scandal of a person writing this in the 1880s, okay? Mingled with fine wheat and the fat of a newborn babe, said the shape of old Goodman Brown. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine reading this and getting that line going, well, wait a minute, how do you get the fat from a bell? Oh, no. Yeah, that's right. Hawthorne's accusing the Puritans of sacrificing babies. This is, this is old magic, yeah. Yes, exactly. This is old magic. Ah, your worship knows the recipe, cried the old lady, cackling aloud. So as I was saying, being all ready for the meeting and no horse to ride on, I made up my mind to foot it. For they tell me there is a nice young man to be taken into communion tonight. But now your good worship will lend me your arm and we shall be there in a twinkling. That can hardly be, answered her friend. I may not spare you my arm, goody Clois, but here is my staff, if you will. So saying, he threw it down at her feet, where perhaps it assumed life, being one of the rods which its owner had formerly lent to the Egyptian magi. <laughs> there it is. Now well, I don't know. disagree with that point. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, I, you know, people say, well, there's no way that, uh, you know, the Egyptian magicians could do the things they did. I'm like, why not? Why not? They had Satan on their side. Right. Right. I mean, it, and the and, New yeah. Testament surely takes that in to say that Pharaoh is the epitome of, you know, of the yeah. devil himself. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the oppression and the slavery and bondage and all of and that. Also, um, notice that the reference to the devil was Goodman Brown going back yeah that the devil now is just of oh, this fact however goodman brown could not right it's like well wait a minute are you the devil or goodman brown the shape there it is mingled with fine wheat and the fat of a newborn babe said the shape of old goodman brown it's old goodman it's his grandfather right but not but it is <laughs> yeah she she recognized him for who he is she's right. not That's frightened what I'm by saying him. is that the devil always appears to you as an angel of light he always appears to you as what you're looking for as a friend as a friend exactly yeah she even says as much or and the only person here. that he never tried to hide himself from was jesus <laughs> well the same with the demons right yeah well they can't hide from him, so why bother well so they just acknowledge him yeah <laughs> yeah what do you have to do with us son of the living god Okay, we'll just say how it is. Fine. Right. <laughs> so, the Egyptian Magi. Of this fact, however, Goodman Brown could not take cognizance. He had cast up his eyes in astonishment, and looking down again beheld neither Goody Clois nor the serpent staff, but his fellow traveler alone, who waited for him as calmly as if nothing had happened. That old woman taught me my catechism, said the young man, and there was a world of meaning in this simple comment. Mm -hmm. This woman... Think about that, too, though, that Hawthorne is really pointing out the naivety of youth. Right. That we're well, all mani sinners. Manipulative, too. How you right. can be manipulated. Yes. That we're all naive. We're all, we all look up to those people who mentored us, who mean a lot to us. And then when we find out as adults and we see them with adult eyes, the disappointment of, oh, you're just like everybody else. You're a sinner just like the rest of us. So, or worse, yeah. in or, this case. In this case, way worse. But, yeah. Yeah. So they continued to walk onward while the elder traveler exhorted his companion to make good speed and persevere in the path, discoursing so aptly that his argument seemed rather to spring up in the bosom of his auditor than to be suggested by himself. As they went, he plucked a branch of maple to serve for a walking stick and began to strip it of the twigs and little boughs which were wet with evening dew. So if you want to identify the devil, just look for a guy with a walking stick because he's always got to have one. Why is that? I don't know. That's a good There's question. something about sticks. Yeah. The moment his fingers touched them, they became strangely withered and dried up as with a week's sunshine. He can't touch fresh dew. Mm -mm. Or, the, or, or a live branch. Or a live branch, exactly. Yeah. So anything of God, he can't touch it. If he does, it dies. Which, this is a great point, isn't it, though? Deliver mm -hmm. us from evil in the Lord's Prayer. We make the sign of the cross to remind us that we were delivered from evil at our baptism. 
Meaning the devil can roar like a lion. He can tempt us, seduce us, try to bewitch us, but he can't touch us. All right, but Jesus does touch us. I mean that exactly. There, I mean, yes, the water of baptism, the Closer word spoken, then his next breath. Yeah, and then his and body. And in blood. our vocations, we are the instruments by which God embraces and loves our neighbor. Mm -hmm. That actually hugging your neighbor, embracing your neighbor, saying good morning, how are you doing to your neighbor? That's God in the neighbor. That's first article stuff. Right, and we talked about this with lockdowns, mm -hmm. um, yes. but I think masking is the same way. Is that of I mean, it is. They, they, I know, I know the intent was <laughs> preservation of life, um, but the actual effect we know who's like exactly my own, right? But it's ins it's insulating, it's insular, yeah. right? And and no one can live on you know to themselves alone. We actually have him about that too. Um, that that it's a, it ends up being demonic because think about like how does Christ come? you know, to, to his people where two or three are gathered, not, not right. solo. Right. And so then there's that mutual consolation and, and uh, comfort. Right. You know, but that can't happen in isolation. It, it, I don't even know how effective it is over the internet. Although I think it, it can to some degree, but it's not the same. No, it's a very different thing. No, you know, telephone calls the same way, right? Yeah. It's, it's very different than an in-person conversation. Right. So even if you're not a big techie person, you understand that, right? You know, that it's a lot different to fly and visit somebody than it is to call them on the big phone. time. Yeah. 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 So thus the pair proceeded at a good free pace until suddenly in a gloomy hollow of the road, Goodman Brown sat himself down on the stump of a tree and refused to go any farther. Friend said he stubbornly. My mind is made up. Not another step will I budge on this errand. What if a wretched old woman do choose to go to the devil when I thought she was going to heaven? Is that any reason why I should quit my dear faith and go after her? You will think better of this by and by, said his acquaintance composedly. Sit here and rest yourself a while. And when you feel like moving again, there is my staff to help you along. There it is again, right? Second time he's offered it to him. He offered the staff to, to Goody Cloyce so, and she yeah, took it. Something about this staff. It means that you received it from him willingly and freely. Oh, that's a, that's a, that is, I mean, how many of the, I was going to ask this question. How many of the tropes yeah. <laughs> that, that are being established as we were talking about before, yeah. how many of them are from Hawthorne and then they persist? Right. And how many of them are ones that he's picking up on and right. then he's carrying forward? It's yeah. kind of an interesting idea, but there is that, that, what do they call it? Like a devil's bargain or something yes, like that? Yes, percent like, you take the coin or Correct. you take, as soon as you accept, you ha, right. if you accept right. what he gives, right. then you, then now you're enslaved. Go back to the precedent set by Abraham and how that travels through the rest of the ethic of Israel. Abraham refuses to accept anything for free. He pays for everything. Hmm. He refuses to be indebted to others. Hmm. Because it's basically like the, the beginning of the Godfather. Godfather, I need your help. So oh, yeah. You, you know, okay, I'm going to do this for you. But in the future, I'm going to come and ask you for a favor and you can't refuse me. Well, Jesus kind of picks up on that too because he has the parable, right? Where, or it's not a parable. He said he's din having dinner at the Pharisee's house, right? And yeah. he's, he's like, when you offer a feast, don't don't invite the, the rich and the whatever, right. the people, because they'll, they'll just want to repay you. Yeah. There's this like tit for tat kind of thing yes. or quid pro quo. Right. And instead, invite the, the poor, the blind, yeah. the lamed, and the maimed, those yeah. who cannot repay you. Right. And you re it, it, so it's it's kind of an inverse of that, right. you know, where it's like, like yeah, don't put yourself in a position where you're indebted, mm -hmm. but actually there is a kind of indebtedness that's good, right? right? When it's, which is the deliverance of the gospel, the feast. And this comes over from the Germanic tradition because, I again, I did those two podcasts on the whole matter of honor and loyalty and worth. Mm -hmm. The old Germanic tradition of giving gifts as a reward for your loyalty, Tolkien tears that apart and points out, rightly, they were never gifts because they were always conditional. Your loyalty was the condition. The rings of power. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that's why in the Lord of the Rings, when there's a gift given that's a true gift, there, there's no conditions placed upon it and it's never brought up again. That's why like when Aragorn and Frodo have that confrontation at the end after oh. Boromir is killed and Frodo offers him the ring and he's like, I can't, it's I can't carry given that weight. Me. It's not yeah. given to me to carry. Like, Aragorn's literally the only noble person, other than Sam, technically, but as far as this goes, like, he's yeah. noble. Like, he yeah. recognizes, if I take this, I will destroy everybody. Well, but his, his nobility is in his humility. Exactly. Yeah. 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 
But there are all, yeah, there are the gifts, like the elven gifts, right. I suppose. And they're, and they're, they're, they're for a time of need. Mm-hmm. Um, but and you can look at the three books. What's the trajectory of all the, everybody in the fellowship? They have to be humiliated and humbled. Oh, I like this idea. They, of, yeah. And then they receive the gift. Um, but then also you have the the mithril, you know the yeah. uh, the vest. It's stolen by the by the orcs, and it becomes yes. a curse to them. Exactly because it wasn't given to them, mm-hmm. and they fight over it and they kill each right. other. And, yeah. And so, and this goes back to Sauron then, which is this, and this is what Tolkien says in his lectures. Sauron represents the old Germanic pagan tradition of offering a gift with a condition. So every ring that he gives comes with a condition. You have to give me your absolute undying obedience. <laughs> and the consequence is always death on all of them. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I'm going to give you this ring of power. The entire world is yours. Stop me if you've heard this one before. But in order for me to give you the world and power, again, mystery, miracle, and authority, I need you to do whatever I tell you. But you have to accept the ring of your own free will. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Again, the serpent, the dragon, never forces them to eat it. They eat the fruit of their own volition. Well, this is why I asked you in the text, because I was thinking about this. Yeah. You know, what if, how, how would you define it as something as state-owned or state-controlled? Mm-hmm. Like, what percentage of their, say, annual budget, or sure. how many of the people involved in the organization mm-hmm. you know, um, receive state funding? Would it, would it have to be before you'd say, no, that's actually a state-controlled organization mm-hmm. or, state, or state-owned? You pay taxes, um, you know, right? Right. So and then you're it's not just. Owned. I wasn't just thinking personally. I was thinking about church, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because you know, we have a yeah. school, and we're going. You know, this is our first year. We're going to get uh, voucher money from the state. Okay. And you say, well, how much? Okay. So if it's, in our case, it'll be a quarter of the budget is received. Yeah, you know, from the trap. state. Right, which is that's been the accusation all along. I mean, I think it's a it's a calculated uh, risk for us. Should we go say, back and read about how Satan is uh, really good <laughs> friends with the governor? And... Okay. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, know. I know. I know. I right. know. I know. It's like I I'm completely. It's not just being you know well, more libertarian anarchic. No, but I'm, I'm saying listen. Let's ask ourselves the question. Right? Is Walker a Christian man? That's not my governor. Sorry, what's the governor? He was. He was Roman Catholic, I think. Okay, um, that's right. Or pro- Protestant of some. The, the current the Evers? Guy? Evers, thank you. Sorry, that was my bad. Um, he, he, he puts mm-hmm. on no airs of having any kind of Christian faith. Correct, that's what I'm saying. And then okay. you look at your legislature, and you look at how they, again, what laws they enact, what legislation they put forward, how they react to certain things that we as Christians theologically are like, nope. and yes. Mostly duplicitous, actually. Right. So then you're, you're asking, should we take money from people who are duplicitous, and ungodly, and think that this is coming without any condition. <laughs> I know. Well, this is where we have these terms, like devil's bargain or exactly. making a deal with the devil. Yeah. Again, you don't have to take the voucher money. It's optional. It's completely voluntary. But if you do, the next time we shut down the state, you will shut down. Well, what was the other one? Um, free reduced lunch. Mm-hmm. Any USDA program, they're requiring Correct. that you... Uh, mm-hmm. we, our, our, we have people fighting this at the state level, but requiring that you not have assigned bathrooms to one 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 sex Correct. male mm-hmm. female they have yeah. to be available to people who right. identify even mm-hmm. if they're biologically you know so yeah. at the usda level yes and like and then we're going to restrict your your government aid for well we're, we're not going to let we you don't feed teach the kids our kids principles what? we don't teach them principles right we don't teach them that integrity and principles are important right and therefore yeah, so, they grow up without them and but when I, but I was pointing comes this up. Then they have no principles, so they say, "What does it matter?" So I've thought about this with um, uh, benefits, right? Yeah. With, with full-time workers, right? Because we have health insurance, and mm-hmm. uh, as much as in our case, Concordia plans is what we use, which mm-hmm. is which is entirely owned, operated by our church body for yeah. benefit of our church workers. Yes, it's administered through other health insurance companies, and they're all terrible, but. Yeah. On the other hand, all the money coming in and all the money is distributed to our workers. This is the point of it. It's a. This is the only reason why we have health insurance. Mm-hmm. You know, as a church body, is because it had to be fraternal that way. Right. Otherwise, we were actually when those things were created you know, fifty years ago, we were morally opposed to the idea of a state run or, mm-hmm. you know, a business because we saw it as gambling basically. Right. Um. So you look at that and like, well, but we could save a lot of money if we just put everybody on whatever state plan or Obamacare plan that they you know, qualify for. There you go. We could save a lot of money. We could even give it back to them as salary, right? 
At what Damn. cost, though? It's too bad you see where I'm nobody going? writes about money in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> or that we don't have a, a tradition within the Lutheran church itself that talks about these things. Right, right. At length. So, so I mean, taking uh, Caesar's coin uh, mm -hmm. makes you Caesar's slave, ultimately. Yes. Well, we'll or whatever, however the expression goes. No, you're right. Servant? 100%. I think slavery starts is the with a right B, word. but yeah, we're good. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there's that too. That works. Yeah. Uh, bag man. And, I was thinking of the word bag. Well, and I hear, I hear the, uh, I hear the, I've heard the logic of like, well, we'll take it while we can until we can, and then we'll just drop out of the program. Okay, fine, maybe. Except, mm -mm. no. Yeah. No. You won't read Romans seven. Read mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter eight. Right. So it does seem to be like this whole, that, that's why this conversation is resonating with me quite a yes. bit because I've been mentally kind of uh, mm -hmm. working through the logic of it. Yeah. And, you know, so we can actually have a conversation. And I agree 100% from a practical standpoint. Listen, we need this money. We need this help. This would really bolster us financially. I mean, I'm I, even the same way with like, oh, let's have the tax dollars follow the student. Right, which sure. is what they're yeah, doing absolutely. in Arizona. Yeah. Right, new law there, and I think other places too. Mm -hmm. It's like, so here's the amount of money we spend per pupil, and we're just going to give that back to you. Yeah. Uh, but it has to be distributed, you know, to even to homeschool. Right, mm -hmm. they even allowing that. Like, why don't you just not take it from us in the first place? Right. How about how about we just all pay to educate our children? There you go. And we put it like if we want to use the you know, the one that our community provides, we'll mm -hmm. use that school. We want to use yeah. the one our church provides, we'll use that mm -hmm. one. Want to do it at home on our own, we'll do that. Like, wouldn't it be just easy just not to take it from us in the first place? Would, but it's not going to happen, so. So, in, instead, we're all indentured through obligatory, what do they call go. it, compulsory education. Yeah, it's chattel slavery. So we've already, hmm. Yeah. This is not very encouraging. All right. Well, that's why we have Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, I tell you what, let's... Yeah. Okay. How much more so, do we have? I don't uh, quite know. a bit. We're going to have to go uh, another two episodes on this. Yeah, okay. for sure. Yeah. All right. So without more words, he threw his companion the maple stick and was as speedily out of sight as if he had vanished into the deepening gloom. Notice what he did? Disappeared. Goodman wouldn't take the stick from him, so he threw it to him. I'll just leave that there for you in case you, you know. Eh, it's right there if you need it. Notice, again, he threw the stick to the ground at Goody Cloyce's feet. He did not hand her the stick. He touched her with it to get her attention. And then he threw it at the ground and she picked it up. It always has to be accepted. Yep. Huh. It has to be by choice. And by There's the way, your he will. Can't, <laughs> and he can't touch you. Remember, he can't touch you because you're of God. Even though you may be a Satanist at night, you're still a creature of God. I can't touch you. Not physically. There is something yet. to that. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> So the you see that with, uh, that's, that's echoes of Job, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. He has to get permission. So the young man sat a few moments by the roadside, applauding himself greatly and thinking with how clear conscience he should meet the minister in his morning walk, nor shrink from the eye of good old Deacon Gookin. And what calm sleep would be his that very night, which was to have been spent so wickedly, but so purely and sweetly now in the arms of faith. I won! Amidst these pleasant and praiseworthy meditations, Goodman Brown heard the tramp of horses along the road and deemed it advisable to conceal himself within the verge of the forest, conscious of the guilty purpose that had brought him thither, though now so happily turned from it. Also, there's echoes of uh, Pilgrim's Progress even in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? the choices, faced with choices, the choices. Choices, the use of language, on the path. Mm-hmm. So on came the hoof tramps and the voice of the riders, two grave old voices conversing soberly as they drew near. These mingled sounds appeared to pass along the road within a few yards of the young man's hiding place. But owing doubtless to the depth of the gloom at that particular spot, neither the travelers nor their steeds were visible. Though their figures brushed the small boughs by the wayside, it could not be seen that they intercepted, even for a moment, the faint gleam from the strip of bright sky athwart, which they must have passed. Goodman Brown alternately crouched and stood on tiptoe, pulling aside the branches and thrusting forth his head as far as he durst, Fred durst, without <laughs> discerning so much as a shadow. It vexed him the more because he could have sworn, were such a thing possible, that he recognized the voices of the minister and Deacon Gookin. <clears throat> jogging along quietly as they were wont to do when bound to some ordination or ecclesiastical council. 
while yet within hearing one of the riders stopped to pluck a switch. Of the two, reverend sir, said the voice like the deacons, I had rather miss an ordination dinner than tonight's meeting. They tell me that some of our community are to be here from Falmouth and beyond, and others from Connect Connecticut and Rhode Island, besides several of the Indian powwows, who after their fashion know almost as much deviltry as the best of us. Moreover, there is a goodly young woman to be taken into communion. Uh-oh. Mighty well, Deacon Gookin, replied the solemn old tones of the minister. Spur up, or we shall be late. Nothing can be done, you know, until I get on the ground. Nothing can be done until I get on the ground. That's a double entendre, by the way. Are you starting to get a feel for what's about to happen here? Yeah. No, it's going to have his whole uh, world's going to be shaken here, I think. And then some. Yeah. Well, it already has a great deal. It already deal. has. It's not like this isn't even the bad part yet. Uh, what I like about it is um, we were talking about ooh, probably before we even went live, talking about the numinous, right? Yeah. That which is beyond perception and understanding, yeah. but right. is, right? And how it's almost like Hawthorne is saying. It's better that you know these things. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that which is, I mean, if it remains hidden um, and you, right. y you need, you need to have this revealed to you that, that there is always a, what, a mixture of belief and unbelief, right? Yeah. Well, in and this that, case, there is belief. It's just not Christian. Well, and I think that's the other point I was going to make is, right. is that, um, that we are inherently spiritual, right? We're looking right. for some, we're looking to worship. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just like, yeah. Uh, and it's not always ourselves, although right. that's part of it, you know. And think about this from this perspective, too. I was thinking about this yesterday again, that if you asked Hawthorne if we were a Christian nation or not, he would laugh mm. in your face. I think so. Because, again, you read his short story, he said it in the colonies. Excuse me. And he did write the Scarlet Letter, after all. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know. Um, he would actually argue that this isn't a Christian nation, it's a Satan nation. It's a nation run by Satan that poses as a Christian nation because, to your as godly point, men, yeah, yeah, uh, you have no gospel preacher. Your sacrament is a communion, which we will learn about in the next episode, and it, it definitely doesn't involve Jesus's body and blood, but it will involve somebody's body and blood, or some bodies, and that ultimately discernment must be exercised, especially when someone says. Well, aren't you a good Christian man or woman? Yeah. Or you yeah. can trust me because I'm a good Christian. Well, and I think, you know, we've pointed out the, you know, the real radical atheism that comes out of, you know, mm -hmm. well, really the, the, the Bible thinkers of, uh, yeah. and the enlightenment and, yeah. you know, the scholar, you, and, you know, we pointed out. And the Bible thumpers. The, and the Bible thumpers. Some of the great awakenings and awakening and revivalist movements. Right. And so the point here is that this, I, the, the notion that, that there was a time of um, uh, of spiritual purity <laughs> within, right? right. Within, yeah. And I pointed this out to someone. Oh, because oh, I don't remember what the context was, but just like just read the Book of Kings and Chronicles. You just yeah. you read through even quote unquote God's people, mm -hmm. and like uh, how many how many of the kings of the north were faithful? Uh, zero. Zero. How many of the kings of the south of Judah? Uh, it was something like five out of fifteen <laughs> were, were, you know. Yeah. So Josiah, Hezekiah. I mean, right. there's a if few. If you're running a franchise, yeah, you might want to get better recruiters and, and coaches. And granted, those are the national rulers, but they're the national rulers, and uh, obviously yeah. the people follow them. Right. You know, much like Nineveh repents because the king repents. All right. Mm -hmm. So the people right. follow. Right. And there's no one godly. And there's mm -hmm. very few in the South. And each time in the South, it's like, oh, we found the book of the, the law again. Right, exactly. And there's we weeping the and gnashing and ding. And like, I didn't know we were. But even even like Moses, right? It's mm -hmm. like um, Zipporah, right? It's yeah. like, why aren't you, why aren't we circumcised? Why aren't you, why aren't the boys circumcised? What is right. wrong? <laughs> right. She's not even a, she's not even a Hebrew. Right. Exactly. Again, you want to talk about a righteous pagan. <laughs> what are we doing here? I thought, I thought we worshiped. You know, like, you don't even know your own faith. Like, right. No, I, no, I don't. So, so there is that 
I mean, as much as Hawthorne's kind of given us a downer here about the state of the church and, and the world, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's pretty realistic. And the, the, the idea that there was a golden age of anything, I mean, ultimately right. is, I think, false, but especially, you know, of, of the Christian church on earth. Yep. On earth. We're not talking about in the resurrection and eternity, but certainly on We're earth. We're talking the church militant. That's why it's mm-hmm. called the church militant. What are we, what are we fighting against ourselves? <laughs> Sin, death, and hell. Yeah. 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 Sin, death, and Satan, and yet all of them, well, death is, well, actually, but death is voluntary. We enter into a voluntary relationship with death. Psalm 51. You want another shot? Have another shot. Yeah, go for it. It might kill you. Oh, well. Or it might not. But you know what? You'll never know if you don't try. Well, you'll never know what dose you got either. Ha! Huh? There you go. <laughs> so it's just it's it's roulette. It's yeah. a medical roulette. Exactly. The hoofs clattered again, and the voices, talking so strangely in the empty air, passed on through the forest, where no church had ever been gathered or solitary Christian prayed. There we go. There is no hallowed ground here. It's Whither then grove here? Yep. Whither then could these holy men be journeying so deep into the heathen wilderness? <laughs> There's another problem too, right? The wilderness is heathen. <laughs> yeah, it's untamed. Yes, but the cities, they're the good places, which Hawthorne is blowing up as well. Young Goodman Brown caught hold of a tree for support, being ready to sink down on the ground, faint and overburdened with the heavy sickness of his heart. He looked up to the sky, doubting whether there really was a heaven above him. Yet there was the blue arch and the stars brightening it. The firmament. The firmament. With heaven above and faith below, I will yet stand firm against the devil, cried Goodman Brown. Oops. While he still gazed upward into the deep arch of the firmament and had lifted his hands to pray a cloud, though no wind was stirring, hurried across the zenith and hid the brightening stars. The blue sky was still visible, except directly overhead, where this black mass of cloud was sweeping swiftly northward. Black mass. There we go. Everything's on, on the nose here. <laughs> yep. So I was trying to remember earlier when I was saying Black Sabbath, Black Mass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Aloft in the air, as if from the depths of the cloud came a confused and doubtful sound of voices. Once the listener fancied that he could distinguish the accents of townspeople of his own, men and women, both pious and ungodly, many of whom he had met at the communion table and had seen others rioting at the tavern. The next moment, so indistinct were the sounds, he doubted whether he had heard aught but the murmur of the old forest, whispering without a wind. Right? You refuse to believe your own ears. It can't be true. It can't. I know well, it certainly can't be a mixture of people both at church and those at the bar. Right. Then came a stronger swell of those familiar tones heard daily in the sunshine at Salem Village. But never until now from a cloud of night there was one voice of a young woman uttering lamentations yet with an uncertain sorrow and entreating for some f- f- uh, favor which perhaps it would grieve her to obtain. And all the unseen multitude, both saints and sinners, seemed to encourage her onward. Faith, shouted Goodman Brown, in a voice of agony and desperation. And the echoes of the forest mocked him, crying, Faith, faith, as if bewildered wretches were seeking her all through the wilderness. Yeah, metaphorical, right? Faith. Yeah. 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 Well, notice where he puts his confidence. I mean, this mm-hmm. is another, I, I think, important, faith. important thing. Well, his in faith, faith in people. Yeah, in a person and in the stars. Yeah. Right? Yep. The firmament, the creation, if you want to yeah. speak more broadly. I was like, well, these things, you know, well, it's, yeah. I guess it's it's uh, bloody hot a lot, of, a lot of places in the world at the moment. Right. Like, well, the, look at you putting all your trust in, in uh, the world to protect you. Right. Yeah. So there's one voice, a voice of a young woman, uttering lamentations, woe is me, yet with an uncertain sorrow. What is it really sorrow that he heard? And entreating for favor, give me a break. Mm -hmm. But it might actually grieve her to receive that favor if she knew what they were going to do to her to show her favor. Mm -hmm. All the unseen multitude of saints and sinners who all together encouraged her onward. There, there's a performative aspect of this too. Oh, so much. And and you know that um, I mean Hawthorne's going to be critical of um, 
you know, uh, I guess what wrote liturgy, that kind of yeah. idea or just, yeah. yeah. And so there, there's the, there's, I mean, there's a liturgy happening. Open here. your hymnal mm -hmm. to, yeah. And, and so that's why it's like uncertain sorrow. So is she just, right. she just going through the motions? Is she, right. Is it, is no, it just no, an act? No, why am I going? No, yeah, no. Yeah. Although she's going in the direction of everybody else. Yeah. And she came in the first place and she, she volunteered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one more paragraph and then we'll leave it on a cliffhanger. Okay. The cry of grief, rage, and terror was yet piercing the night when the unhappy husband held his breath for a response. There was a scream, drowned immediately in a louder murmur of voices, fading into far-off laughter as the dark cloud swept away, leaving the clear and silent sky above Goodman Brown. But something fluttered lightly down through the air and caught on the branch of a tree. The young man seized it and beheld a pink ribbon. And now you know why it was important at the beginning of the story. Right, right. My faith is gone, cried he. Oh, you're after gonna hear that too. Okay. Yeah, I got to. Okay. After one stupefied moment, there is no good on earth, and sin is but a name. Come, devil, for to thee is this world given. He's got nothing left. My faith is gone. Because he had no he didn't have any to begin with. Yeah, that's the point, isn't it? Right. He, like you said, he doesn't invoke the name of Christ. He doesn't appeal to God's grace and mercy. Not a single psalm on his lips will he, even though he's catechized. Into what? Well, obviously into the man that they needed him to be at this moment. I, I've referred to this before, and I have to find it in my my rec, in all my uh, digital mm -hmm. records, archives. That, that makes it sound better. Junk folder. Yeah, <laughs> right. The... Uh, the uh, uh, autobiography from my uh, relative who went to yes. seminary back in the mid 18th or uh, 19th century, so 1845 yeah. or whatever. It just the way that he said he had that same comment about his catechesis in Germany. It's like they they I I was catechized and yet I was told nothing of yeah. the faith. Right. It's like well what what did they teach you you right. know in continental Europe at in the mid 19th century? Moralistic, Reason, moralistic, therapeutic, deism. I don't even know how therapeutic it was, but it was certainly well, that's the romanticism <laughs> side of things, probably. I suppose, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, like, my catechist didn't believe anything. Yeah. Didn't. It's like, no. So, what is it? If anybody, any of our listeners, have a PDF or a copy of old 18th century catechisms, I'd read them on the air because it'd be fascinating to just do that. We talk about it a lot, but we really haven't delved into that area of catechisms from that time frame, and I think it would be, actually be kind of fun. Because I know yeah, I, see, I should. I, I know Leia's. I translated Leia's and, and retyped. But Leia's, stuff Leia's like is out of out of step with the that's tradition what I'm at the time. Is like I don't really he's, have anything that's not a because he's not a rationalist. Yeah, yeah, and is reacting against that stuff in his catechisms, which is why there's over 900 questions. Well, and I think, um, yeah, because there's a lot of things to respond to, yeah. and then the more pietist strains are anti-catechetical. <laughs> yeah. Big time. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's what I mean. Have... It'd be fascinating to read that stuff just to get a, a snapshot of the type of, especially from the colonies. Like, I'll just, I'll do in the next week. I'll do a little deep dive to find Puritan catechisms if I can. Oh yeah, and, what's and being referred to here? Yeah, just to see what they've got. It would be fascinating to read it, because I guarantee you, it's a lot of that um, the holiness movement stuff that we've talked about in the past. I think there's a. Um... I've heard this a number of times now from more reform leaning folks because mm -hmm. um, I try to listen and read read broadly enough that I'm aware of what's happening, sure. especially from people that are at least like minded in terms yeah. of, you know, uh, living They're, apart from culture. They hunger know, and thirst for righteousness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but they often it's, it seems very common that people refer to themselves as, as being of like more of a puritanical, mm -hmm. you know, flair. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what the fascination is with the Puritans. Purity cult. Uh, well, I mean, it's look just, around, in, I know dude. it's in the, it's in the name. But I mean, look but, around, look around. But they like, don't, they don't necessarily mean it in moral purity. They, they, they right. do think of it in terms of like, sure. Well, rebellion, right? Because the mm. Puritans fled England, right. the Church of England. Right. Well, that's um, it though. There's, it's a nostalgia for something that it's like in our tradition, people always going back like in the fifties. I mean, back in the fifties, things mm -hmm. were so much better in the fifties. It's like, no, they weren't. That's, well, we that's also your mind. we've talked about this as like, oh yeah, our church was founded by people who fled the Prussian, you know, yeah. Union, and they they yeah. wanted to be able to practice the Lord's Supper the way yeah. that uh, Christ gave it. 
Yeah. Um, cheap farmland in the United States. <laughs> that know? helped a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they could actually, this was frontier land. Yeah. So when right. this church was founded, so they just, right. they went and they set up a homestead and right. they built a farm and, yeah. and it took people, pastors riding around on their horse saying, Hey, wait mm -hmm. a minute, you speak German. Aren't you Lutheran? Right. Let's start a church. Yep. You know, let's get you guys together. Yeah. And a lot of those churches that the that the uh, circuit writers formed right. aren't don't exist anymore. Some of them do, thankfully, but mm -hmm. like ours. But think about what you just said: is that they came from a place where they went to church every Sunday, probably. <laughs> and right. Their kids were catechized and all the things that we've talked about with this this story, and then they came over here and went, "Yeah, we don't have a church or a pastor." And some communities went, "We need a church and a pastor," whereas yeah, others were did. like, "Meh." <laughs> mostly yeah. not, actually. Yeah, mostly, mostly not. not in Minnesota. Mostly not. Well, I think some, I mean, some of it's practical, right? I mean, it takes a long yeah. time to clear and, and you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're busy. I get that. Um, Which, of course, that's the same the excuse we hear today. Hmm. Translated uh, or edited and translated by our Senate president, Matthew Harrison, at home in the House of Our Fathers. Oh, yeah. And some of those essays were written by guys who actually were circuit writers in Minnesota. Well, one's my relative. That's why I know the stories. Okay, cool. But yeah. those circuit writers were covered like 150 miles. Yeah. Like they yeah, were multiple riding. states even yeah yeah and so at you're least thinking here, of friedrich winnikin yeah yep yellow pants he wore yellow yep. pants yellow pants <laughs> so by the way for all those <laughs> lcms pastors out there who are down on celebrity pastors winnikin wore yellow pants just people knew who he was that. the guy the pastor with the yellow pants it's like the, the guy hipster. with the yellow hat yeah absolutely he's the first and the monkey pastor who's the guy with the yellow hat and the monkey the yellow, uh, Curious George and the the man with the yellow hat. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is the just with yellow imperialism pants. and oppression, and it's a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole book on it. Anyways, that and it's the pastor with the tattoos, the pastor with the with the yellow pants, suede, the one who always wears suede plaid. jackets. Yeah, plaid, yep. plaid or suede. Yeah, okay. So this the one who wears fun. a kilt. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed this one. It's obviously I'm delighted beyond uh, reason. To read this again, I love this story so much because it's so it's so evocative. Funny. It's so it evocative. is, isn't it? And yeah. I think of Hawthorne's stories. I mean, I think once you read this, and like you've noted several times, how biblical his analogies mm -hmm. and allusions are, mm -hmm. you can yeah. then go back and read his other stuff, his other short stories, and mm -hmm. recognize this guy is profoundly biblically literate. Yeah. He may have not been a Christian, so to speak. But, he but he's was, not a transcendentalist either. No, he's definitely not a romantic. Not, no. None whatsoever. He's very grounded in reality. Right. In fact, I would argue that that's one of the things he despises. Because, like, Whitman is about, about the, the same, people. Yeah. same time, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. He despises that. Because what he's pointing out is, like, in very real terms, this is what's happening. This is real. I think the, I think the closest for me, you know, would be, um, oh, like, Melville. Mm -hmm. You know, because Melville, I mean, it's not, it's not really all that romantic, maybe the romantic of being at the sea, but you're qu it's quickly It's metaphysical. Dis yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's, it's always, it's this but grand notice too, spiritual then, narrative. Uh, the Scarlet Letter and Moby Dick are both based on true stories. Mm -hmm. So there's that too, though, of these are, these, these stories actually happen in real life. An actual whale, you can find this on YouTube, but an actual whale followed a whaling ship and destroyed it. It's a fascinating story because then they separate out into boats and one group's like, no, I think we should definitely go west. The other group's like, no, I think there's land of the east. And they're like, well, we'll divide and then hope for the best. 50-50. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. But I think that helps ground it in reality that it is based on actual events. And so again, with Hawthorne and with Melville, if you go and read their letters and read their diaries, they were very concerned with the state of culture in the colonies and the society mm -hmm. and how they saw it as having this very dark underbelly, even though all of the, the language and the metaphors and the symbols were all of like, this is God's land. This right. Is and like, and Moby Dick, I mean, the spirituality of it is, yeah. is rich, but the, right. again, like with Hawthorne here, right. there's no Jesus. No. Like, he's fighting which, demons we himself. Have, we have to read the, the past, the minister's sermon from Moby Dick. It's so We good. talked about it. Yeah. We referred yeah. to it. You can find that online with the great Gregory Peck doing it. Oh, really? He's the best. It's the it's the original Disney version of it. But anyways, hmm. yeah, yeah. Gregory Peck preaching from the uh, bow of the pulpit ship is just oof, right. So yeah. good, yeah. Atticus. But um, anyways, yeah. So much today. 
Uh, maybe we should both exercise before we podcast on Fridays. I generally day. try to on Friday. If I'm trying to permits. set up with Coach 2 now because Wednesdays are kind of jammed up for me, so I asked if we could do it Friday mornings instead. But, uh, yeah, if you got any questions, uh, don't email us because we can't answer them. And if you like the podcast, awesome. Go to 1517Donate and let the, let the organization know. And also check out the other stuff that we put out, like the Christian Almanac and the Thinking Fellows and all the books. I think, oh, we, should so books. I think we should adopt, you know, the trope from the 80s, um, time, talents, and treasures. We should do that. Oh, don't, don't. Don't so, burn it with fire. Uh, burn it with. Fire. I mean, obviously, they given us our t given given us their time by listening to the whole thing, right? True, uh, but I always you think of Ned Flanders being the devil. Then going back to the Simpsons. <laughs> so you can time, give talent, treasures, locally, locally. <laughs> I don't know. What other ways could they support the show? Yeah, I have to think about that. Just literally share it on social yeah, media. That's big. That's share big. it with friends and family. Yeah. I mean, I both of us have congregation members who listen to this podcast and my podcast and. Give us feedback about that too. Well, you, you um, have to, you have to share it because if you don't, mm -hmm. um, and you can't just post it on social. That's that's like send it in an email. Is that what you're gonna say? If they don't post it, the devil wins. <laughs> if they don't share it, well, it's just the, the it's not it's not gonna yeah they're not gonna promote us if you just post the link in your show note in your True. feed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Why is it not looping anymore? I don't know. I don't know. It's crazy. Okay. That being said, thank you as always. Of course, 90% of what we say on this podcast is tongue in cheek and meant to be satire. So don't take us as seriously as you might uh, in these very serious times. And the other 10% is just pure theology. So we hope you enjoy it. And it's edifying and helpful. Otherwise, we'll talk to you again real soon. Peace. Yeah, I think I have to put it on grid view to get a loop. Let's see. <laughs> there. I now if I put sink. it on grid view, grid then it gives view. me a loop. Thanks, Fresh. It has, to be, it has to be in grid view. I don't know. I love why. these breakdowns too. It's fun. It's yeah. Well, you know, it's the text isn't it, heavy. I think it that's lets the key. Let your mind kind of go. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to filter. You can but it, it, be open. you know, we've talked about this. It's like doing a Bible study on like an epistle. Yeah. It's like what? You don't need more commentary on top of commentary. Right. Exactly. <laughs> It'd be better like if you're going to read the epistle, read the epistle, and then say, okay. Wait a minute. What is he referring to? Oh, he's referring to this event, right. you know, in the history of Israel. Let's go look well, at like that. It's like reading Haggai after you've read Kings for reference mm -hmm. point. Like, who, mm -hmm. when was Darius mentioned in Kings? Let's go read that first in Chronicles. Yeah. Right. Then read right. Haggai for for reference. Yeah. When I've talked about this, is like no, almost nobody has read Ezekiel that that goes and does a Bible study on Revelation. Isn't like, that wild? How does that make any sense? Yeah. You can't like understand mo any almost all of that. <laughs> it's like yeah. without without. Uh, maybe they've read Daniel, so maybe they get a little bit. No, you got to go to Ezekiel and Leviticus technically. Then at that point, but well, kind of right, string them yeah, together. It's, it's drawing on that, yeah. But anyway. it, it's the fact that again, culture has sold us on apocalyptic literature as something that just happens, versus the Bible literally has an entire tradition of apocalyptic literature, and there's rules. And I was right. actually explaining this last Sunday about Ezekiel about Zechariah. Yeah, like, right. there are rules to this. And luckily, Zechariah says what we're thinking, which is, I have no idea what this means. And the angel then says, let me tell you what this means. The four yeah. anvils are yeah, this. The vision, the then the oracle. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's the great thing about the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ to John or Ezekiel or Daniel, is they, they actually do tell you what the visions mean. Yeah. If you stop asking, what does this mean? But we don't want to know what it actually means. We want to make up for ourselves what it means so that we can take the text by violence. Excuse me. Well, that's that's what I was going to say. Is like, okay, they'll bring you up to the level of perception, but not yeah. to necessarily to the level of, of um, what? Well, scientific understanding, <laughs> you know? Discernment? Well, no, even discernment, but not, not where you can pick it apart into pieces and like, sure. reconstruct okay. it yeah, or something like yeah. that. Right. So, so John is given a lot of the same visuals as Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. um, John actually implies other things from them, or they're expanded, right. or right. because now they're understood in light of right. the gospel. We have history, exactly. Right. It's we have the gospel. Well, yeah, Jesus. Paulson we have Jesus. We have the fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. The 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 Messiah has come, and now that whole event's behind us. It's mm -hmm. not. And it reframes anymore. all of all of those visionary right. elements so that they're right. seen differently now. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I just brought it up in the sense of people will say, well, how will we know if Jesus comes back? And I brought up Project Bluebeam as just a funny side note. 
<laughs> that it's very easy for you to distinguish between the government projecting a false savior descending from the clouds and the actual savior. One, you'll be able to touch him. Two, mm -hmm. we will literally float into the sky to meet him. Three, every oracle of God comes with, I will physically do this and you will know it's me. For example, in, in Zechariah 4, we will all be at peace with each other and be nothing but charitable and selfless. Yeah, it's clearly not Judgment Day yet. I said, when, when the president of any country stands at the podium and says, no more taxes, you will know that Jesus has returned. Mm, I like because it. it. Because, and then everybody will be let out of prison. All debt will be abolished. Are you a millennialist? You're a millennialist. Right. I don't even know what that means. I thought you were saying millennial, millennial kingdom, you know, the one invented no, I just by really reading Revelation. Oh, that millennials. I'm going to change the definition. <laughs> but um, no, he's very clear in, in, his, in everything that he reveals to the preacher. This is what this means. And you'll know it's me because when I come, because notice the angel in Zechariah constantly says, the proof of what I'm saying to be true is that these things will happen. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's how you test and, the spirits. Is it right, physically and, true? And as I pointed out, it's like, okay, then uh, fast forward to the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Has Have these things happened? Correct. Mm, kind of, maybe, in some cases, a little yeah. bit, but not completely, right. not but fully. Not completely. Yeah. There, there's still a longing and a hope for the things that were right. promised that haven't, it hasn't met their right. fulfillment. Right. Which is yeah. why we're still arguing about law and gospel. We're still, there's still divisions amongst us, as Paul notes. Well, as why much as Christ has come again, right? Yeah. And fulfilled it, it's still mm -hmm. by, it's still by faith. <laughs> Correct. Always. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're still waiting. We're still watching. Yeah. All right. Wow. It's frustrating. And yet, I suppose. good at the same time because we have hope. <laughs> well, but but unlike uh, Mr. Goodman Brown, where's our mm -hmm. faith, right? Right. Is it in uh, faith? Is it in ourselves? Is right. it in you know our experience? No. Right. Yeah. Well, this is why, come circling back to what I said earlier, this is why you don't use the term good Christian or bad Christian for that matter. You're a Christian or you're not. And yeah. the Christian is a Christian by confession of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Not Jeffrey Dahmer else. was a good Christian in the end. In the end. Well, he was beat to death by Jesus, though. Was that you the guy, that? Was yeah. the prisoner that killed him? No, the prisoner that killed him thought he was the physical manifestation <laughs> of Jesus Christ. I did not know that part of the story. Yeah, he beat him to death with a broom handle. I knew he beat him to death, but I didn't know his name was Jesus, and he thought he was Jesus. No, he, no he was, his name wasn't Jesus. He thought he was Jesus Christ. The man who killed Jeffrey Dahmer believed he was Jesus. Exacting. Not like Jesus Salivar. Like That's he what literally I thought you were was like, say. I'm okay. Jesus and you're Satan and I have to kill you. That was what he yelled while he was beating him to death with a handle. <sighs> he was screaming, you're the devil and I'm Jesus and I have to, you know, basically. Oh, that's not a good world. end to the story. Oh, well. Right. No, it's crazy. But maybe, you know. maybe uh, Dahmer was like Stephen, right? Father, forgive him. Ugh. Can you imagine? But that's hard right. to hear, right? It's like, good hard. question. Well, yeah. How could you say that? It's revolting. Well, it is. Mm -hmm. To the flesh, sure. Right. Yeah, it makes no sense. So on that high note, <laughs> <laughs> grace and mercy came through Jesus Christ. The law came through Moses. So and what makes a Christian a Christian? Go, yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ for you for the forgiveness of sins. So as always, as a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's it. Amen. That, that's what makes a Christian a Christian. So on that, I'm going to go have tacos. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back. We'll come back to this. Yes, we will. Good okay. conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.